Okay, I think I will uh, make a start because we've got a lot of papers to get through um, this afternoon and we want to give as much time for conversation um, and the presentations as possible. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Turner and I'm Deputy Director for Research at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. Let me extend a very warm welcome to everyone logging on um, this afternoon or whatever time it is, wherever you are based in the world, to the Thinking from Asia panel. And this is the final panel of the London Asia Art Worlds programme. We have often described London Asia Art Worlds as a murmuration, a virtual meeting ground in which conversations, images and ideas have twisted, turned, swooped and swirled across a series of interconnected papers, performances, discussions and interventions. And many of the audience members have taken time out of busy schedules to join us on more than one occasion and we're incredibly grateful to everyone for being part of this journey across these five weeks. The London Asia Art World programme has been co-organised as a collaboration between myself, Hamad Nasser, who's a curator, strategic advisor and senior research fellow at the Paul Mellon Centre, and Professor Ming Tiampo, who's professor in the Department of Art History and Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art and Culture at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And Ming is also the second holder of the London Re Asia Research Award. And I just want to take a moment to say a very heartfelt personal thank you to Hamad and Ming here. Um, it's both a personal thank you and an official one on behalf of the Paul Mellon Centre. Their intellectual generosity, tireless appetite for boundary crossing, an ability to foster conversations that are, are once both critical and convivial is written all over this program. So thank you so much, Ming and Hamad, for your collaboration and your friendship, not only across the five weeks, but all the many months, even years that have gone into planning this event. And an event like this is the work of many hands indeed. And I also just want to name the people who are not visible to you on screen um, during the event, but who, without whom this programme would not have been possible. And that's the events team at the Paul Mellon Centre, Shauna Blanchfield, Danny Convey, and Ella Fleming, who's currently on uh, parental leave, but who was crucial in shaping the administration for this event. And also Tom Scott, Lucy Andia, Tom Powell, Maysoon Rahani and Harriet Sweet, um, as well as the finance team at the Paul Mellon Centre. Again, they've all supported us and made uh, this murmuration um, happen. I want to also thank all the speakers, chairs and artists who have contributed to the programme. And I encourage you to explore the conference dedicated website to find out more. And on that site, you can find out, you can find the recordings of all previous events online in case you missed any of them and want to catch up. And you can also find out more about the wider London Asia project um, of which this programme is a part and the work of the Paul Mellon Centre. Before I hand over to Ming to say a little bit more, let me just walk you through the Paul Mellon Centre's housekeeping guidelines for our online webinars. And again, I'm sure you're all very used to Zoom webinars by now, but each institution perhaps does things a little bit differently. Um, today, we'll start with a keynote paper um, of about 45 minutes, which will be followed by a question and answer session. These events are very much about research and building a community of research around conversations and dialogue. So we really encourage you to load up your questions by typing them in the Q&A box and our chair will be able to read those out. And as we go along, you can also use the chat function which uh, to add links, to add thoughts, just to say hello to us. We really like that sense of community and connection as we uh, progress through the Zoom webinar. Um, we'll have a break after the, Q and, uh, the keynote um, of about 15 minutes um, and we'll also have um, a, a set of three papers followed by a question and answer session and then at the end of that we're going to have a wrap-up discussion between myself, my co-conveners and John Tain um, of the Asia Art Archive to discuss more broadly the themes of the whole uh, programme. Um, 
Our um, event is being run by Shauna Blanchfield and Danny Convey, and they are on hand um, to answer any questions you might have um, about the session. And again, you can um, use the chat function to uh, get in contact uh, with us. The session will be recorded and made available to the public. And if you'd like to use a closed captioning function, you can do that by clicking on the CC live transcript button um, at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ming Tiampo. Thank you, Sarah. Before I begin, I would like to express my personal thanks as well to you, to Hamad, and to the entire PMC team for this extraordinary experience, a journey that we've all taken together, um, a friendship, an intellectual fellowship um, that goes on and on, as you know, um, in many wonderful ways. And um, I look forward to seeing how this develops in the future. It's, it's been really exciting for me to be a part of this and um, to be convening these conversations that I think over time are leading to a kind of decolonial um, turn in the ways in which we understand the entanglements between both British and um, Asian art histories, understanding worlded art histories um, in different ways um, through, uh, a way, through a, an awareness and a critical engagement with questions of empire. So I think these are really important um, in conversations that we're engaging in. And one of the ways in which we're hoping to, uh, to um, continue these uh, conversations is through the Collaborative Data Project. Um, and I'd just like to take a few minutes to tell everybody about the Collaborative Data Project today. Um, during yesterday's session on Thinking Through Empire, Tim Berenger asked an important question about how we change our methodologies in order to ask different questions and to look at different objects as we conduct research that takes into account the epistemologies and biases of empire. And so, you know, I think this is something that has been central to the London Asia project um, at large, but also to London Asia art worlds as we seek to find ways of imagining new worlds um, alongside um, the artists who did so um, in, between London and Asia. And so one of the, our main objectives is to find new ways of um, tracing all of these different um, pathways, examining different artists, and trying to write forgotten histories, seed new research to make these methodological interventions. And one of the challenges there is, of course, that the sands of indifference um, and racism um, and uh, neglect have obliviated even the most basic information about many artists, their exhibitions, and their histories. So what we're trying to do in this collaborative data project is that we're trying to surface and reconnect some of these traces. And we think this is of the utmost importance. This is a first step towards co-constituting this transnational research space as a field of inquiry, as a conversation. And going forward, we hope to be able to include all of you, we're inviting you to join us in this enterprise, which we can use as um, a, a baseline, a sort of foundation for continuing these rich conversations. So to begin with, we're asking for your collaboration and your contributions in identifying artists from Asia who spent time in the UK, as well as artists from the Asian diaspora who were born in the UK, the art schools that they went to and the exhibitions in which they showed. And the intention here is twofold, to crowdsource and create a database of artists that can serve our, create, our community of researchers, you as starting points for further research. Secondly, to visualize the entangled cartographies of this field of emerging um, inquiry between the UK and Asia, between roughly 1850 and about 2000, between empire and decolonization. So there are many ways of visualizing the data once we have gathered it. And that's what's really interesting and exciting about this possibility which enables us to see many different patterns, such as, for example, um, the art schools that um, 
artists went to. Or um, exhibitions also can serve as contrapuntal nodes. And here I'm showing you um, exhibitions that are grouped by year, um, just from the data that we've put in so far. Um, and here we also have um, a nodal map of all of the places where these exhibitions took place, so actual institutions. We hope to be able to experiment with data visualizations and that enable us to creatively think about how art history is written, to see new patterns and frameworks. So for example, on this map, um, you see the density of UK exhibitions by region and also UK exhibitions by location. Again, based on a very small data set that we've just put in so that you can see what this looks like and what might be possible. Um, what we found very interesting about these two maps and, um, that revealed something new to us was that actually uh, not everything was happening in London. And in fact, there was quite um, a, 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 a density of exhibition activity that was ha happening outside of London within the UK. Whoops. Ah, yes. So what we're asking you to do is actually you, you can go on to this collaborative data project website and the link will be in the chat. And you can see here that there are two links, um, one for artist data and one for exhibition data. And what that will lead you to are these two Google Forms that are fairly straightforward. And what we're do doing is we're asking all of you to input information about um, artists who are from Asia or from the Asian diaspora who are in the UK um, and um, giving us information about exhibitions and art schools that they went to so that we can bring everything together and start to see what these patterns look like. For example, what happens when we use cr critical mass data methodologies in the place of the historical filters that have been shaped by colonial, racist, and sexist attitudes? And what we want to know is what happens when we surface these histories of artists who are working alongside their white male peers, winning awards, exhibiting, getting commissions, and building careers, and which who have now been obscured by the structural biases of art history. So what we're hoping is that these, um, this project will help us to surface that. So this is an invitation, a call to action to you, your networks, and your students to join us in creating these, a data set that will help us to visualize these new cartographies. Um, we'll be planning on following this up with a workshop or an edit-a-thon. For those of you who would like to take us up on this um, invitation, and this will also give you an opportunity to meet other people who are interested in the same um, channels of research. And of course, if you would like me to come to your class um, to explain the project um, so that your students can join us, I'm quite happy to do so. So please just get in touch. So please don't worry about um, the any data that you enter being partial. Um, we just look forward to continuing these conversations with you and to working together and to hope that this will encourage all of you to continue being in touch with all of us and to continue the conversations. And with that, I would like to hand you over to Hamad. Thank you, Ming. And as, um, as Ming has so eloquently um, uh, shared with you, in, in London Asia Art World, we are proposing new ways of imagining art history through and beyond national and regional boundaries, and, and testing new models for writing art history through collaborative practice. It is through such methods that we think that art histories in both Britain and Asia are disrupted, and their complexities revealed through layered connections via the infrastructure that we all sort of recognize as belonging to the art world about exhibitions and art schools and institutions, but also paying attention to the worlds that they carry, to friendships and socialities, to aesthetics, and politics and philosophy, or as we considered yesterday, the machinations of empires. Offering relational stories that negotiate difficult colonial and entangled pasts, shared presents, and possible collaborative futures, the papers, provocations, and discussions of London Asia art worlds are an urgent reminder that the contours of nationhood are complex and of the importance of making worlds rather than closing them. And of course, it is not lost on us 
that this series of events is being co-organized, hosted, and funded by the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, and the pressures, challenges, and questions that such research puts up on the framing of art practice and history through the lens of nation. Now, in this last and eighth session of London Asia Art World, we want to end on the possibility for the production and circulation of new forms of knowledges, knowledges that can disrupt the established order of things that we are familiar with uh, and that have been circulated quite often through imperial structures. Key to this, and, and as typified by my co-conveners and the pleasure it's been working with the team in developing this, is the importance of friendship as method. And in continuation of that, we're really thrilled to have another friend and colleague, Ivan Kuhn, join us to chair this final panel, Thinking from Asia. Ivan is Associate Professor and Chair of the Fine Arts Department at the University of Hong Kong. Her publications include Nara Yoshitomo, a Chinese canton, painting the local and export art, and a defiant brush, Su Renshan and the politics of painting in 19th century Guangdong. She is the recipient of many research awards, including a Fulbright Senior Fellowship, American Council of Learned Scholars, and visiting scholarships at Cambridge and Columbia University. Kuhn also works in the contemporary art field as an independent curator. And in 2014, she was the guest curator of It Begins with Metamorphosis, Shubing at the Asia Society in Hong Kong. And she was one of the curators for the 12th Guangzhou Biennale in 2018, and is presently working on an exhibition of Hong Kong art, So Long, Thanks Again for the Fish in Helsinki. I my pleasure to welcome Ivan. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I want to apologize ahead of time if there are any short glitches, as my internet connection is experiencing some instability. But with apologies given, let me begin. I would like to begin first by thanking the organizers, Hamad, Ming, and Sarah, of this incredibly rich series of panels of London Asia Art Worlds. I also want to extend my thanks to the team at Paul Mellon Center in giving such a smooth operation or making this such a smooth operation. The title of today's panel, Thinking from Asia, is in some ways a touchstone for many of the papers from this series and their starting positions from outside colonial centers. But the papers today foreground world making, sometimes in dialogue with nation building, the heirs of imperialism, and an Asia with all its many different variations, as a site from where artists, writers, teachers, and scholars can also be authors of global political thoughts that can impact and affect ideas of worlds in a post-imperial future. One way of contextualizing today's panel and the last of the series is also to recall some of the earlier provocations made in previous weeks. I'm only gonna select one or two things that struck me. And I would also ask of our audiences to share their thoughts, whether directly of today's papers, but also please do feel free to discuss past papers and ideas in connections across panels. Please do write in the chat box with any thoughts, comments, and questions to help build future research and further collaborative thinking. One of the provocations echoed across the panels and which we were also here today is the recovery of anti-colonial thinkers as global figures and how they provide alternative pathways of thinking of decolonization, including demystifying the easy identification of decolonization and uh, nation building and to decode war historical materialism. That all the papers have been provocative is not surprising. It is embedded within the very title of the series of London Asia, which has provided a guiding concept and which includes scalar analysis as a method of repurposing existing structures of relations, as well as producing new scales. We have seen units of scales from the most intimate of the body, such as touch, as well as larger units like collections, kinships, city, nation, region, and a globe. The process of scaling, often dynamic, challenges orders and hierarchies, not least because the production of scales is always relational. And with that also comes, it carries along with it, the um, um, subjectivities. 
So in the past five weeks, the papers have demonstrated how new scales can be effective models to disrupt colonial enterprises and its tendency of sequestering people. And for me, one of the interest, interesting points to emerge, and one again, which we will continue to see this afternoon, is how it can serve the purpose of, re, of introducing dimensions of mutuality and reciprocity in how we talk and write about worlds and what we do in them. I am increasingly feeling a sense of ethical duty to rethink my role as a scholar, a teacher, and my complicity in accepting normative practices that sustain coloniality, a question that was raised in yesterday's panel. Am I doing enough to move beyond the singular eye of sovereignty? Not least is that if we are to truly continue these conversations, we must figure out how to act on them to prevent the stagnation that has developed in the wake of neoliberalism. I'm going to cite one of the anti-colonial thinkers who have made appearances, sometimes shadowy in the series, Akili Membe, who speaks of how becoming human in the world is a matter of journeying, where movement is transfiguration. He conjures a very strong image where the journeying figure is always moving and changing, is constantly creating and recreating worlds with potentially new bonds. Actions make worlds, which also asks of us to be present in order to anticipate futures without determining them. To bring that back to scalar terms, it can also be about the racial base and dynamic relations, moving back and forth from objectivity into realms of speculations and magic. So much of what has been discussed are subjects and things that are not easily made tangible or legible in our current systems, such as fictiveness, invisibility, and the haptic experience that have been covered in the previous panels. How do we make those intangible things tangible, which is one of the things that we will hear again in our keynote uh, paper today, but also in the following papers. What sort of toolkit is needed to find methodologies or can recalibrate our existing ones to articulate the consistently inconsistent relations that unfold in world making projects. A question again which Ming has stated at the beginning of this panel and that has continuously popped up. I will leave that question on pause and perhaps return to it in our Q&A sessions to follow. But let me move on to introduce uh, today's keynote speaker. Patrick Flores is Professor of Art Studies at the Department of Art Studies in the, at the University of Philippines, which he chaired from 1997 to 2000, sorry, 2000, 2003, and curator of the Vargas Museum in Manila. He is the director of the Philippine Contemporary Arts Network and one of the curators of Under Constructions, New Dimensions in Asian Arts in 2000 and the Guangzhou Biennale in 2008 with position papers. He was a visiting fellow at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC in 1999 and an Asian Public Intellectuals Fellow in 2004. Among his publications are Painting History, Revisions in Philippine Colonial Art, published in 1999, Remarkable Collection, Art, History, and the National Museum, 2006, and Past Peripheral, Curation in Southeast Asia, in 2008. He has many curatorial projects, including an exhibition of contemporary arts from Southeast Asia and Southeast Europe, titled South by Southeast, and a Philippine Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2015. He was the artistic director of Singapore Biennale 2019 and will be the curator of the Pavilion Pavilion, sorry, the Taiwan Pavilion for the Venice Biennale in 2022. His paper today is entitled Aroundness Awareness to Rework Art Out of Asia. Let me pass over to Patrick. Thank you, Yvonne, for that uh, introduction. I also would like to uh, thank and congratulate the Paul Mellon Center and the conveners of this uh, conference for, uh, uh, for this initiative. And finally, I'd like to say hello to uh, the presenters of this panel. I, I look forward to learning from their papers later. So let me now share my screen. Aroundness, awareness to we work art out of Asia. In the relay of words that conceptualizes this seminar alongside London, Asia, and art, it is the term worlds that is plural amid the singularities. And in the explication of this particular session, the, fo the focus shifts to Asia, but one that is not fixed to a geographical or geopolitical point. Asia is rather imagined as a coordinate animated by prepositions from Asia, out of Asia, and beyond Asia. 
It is this kinetic position within a plurality, a reflective Asia within several worlds that strikes me as regenerative. I would like to begin with this imbrication of Asia within worlds, of a particularity within an ecology. And in this beginning, I turn to the trope, to a trope from the languages in the islands of the Visayas in the Philippines that intertwines the intuition of the universe with its sensing so that the image of aroundness intersperses with the condition of awareness. The trope is a kalibutan. It's root referencing the orbit and the act of encompassing. In everyday speech, however, kalibutan likewise speaks to consciousness on the one hand and the state of either unknowing or disclaiming on the other. In the translation from Spanish in the 19th century lexicon, it is desconocer, a disavowal. In Visayan, it is ambot, which expresses incognizance, indifference, or exasperation, something that resists convenient rationality. That Asia is construed as the Kalibutan, a sense of aroundness and awareness, as well as an unknowing, speaks to Edward Said's idea of being out of place. Which he, relates with, which he relates with sleeplessness. In his memoir titled Out of Place, Said reveals that, and I quote him, there is nothing for me as invigorating as immediately shedding the shadowy half-consciousness of a night's loss than the early morning. Worldliness seems to come for Said in the early morning, which may well be in his own theory, late style which alludes to the timeliness of art, exilic and inveterate. It may be, according to him, a moment of, and I quote, intransigence, difficulty, and unresolved contradiction, a sort of deliberately unproductive productiveness, being in and apart from the present. I am drawn to the word half-consciousness as the matrix of possibility of being grounded or attuned to nature and history. In Said's mind, being out of place is akin to experiencing himself as a, quote, cluster of flowing currents. And he elaborates, and I quote, I prefer this to the idea of a solid self, the identity to which so many attach so much significance. These currents flow along during the waking hours, and they require no reconciling, no harmonizing. They are off or out of place but at least they are always in motion, in time, in place, in the form of all kinds of strange combinations moving about, not necessarily forward, sometimes against each other, contrapuntally, yet without one central theme." End of quote. It is in this polyphony, pursuing Said's musical metaphor between the Visayan Kalibutan and Said's out of placeness that I stage a proposition on Asia as restless and aleatory. In this reflection, I converse with two trajectories offered by the discourses around inter-Asia and Asian plays. Inter-Asia as an intellectual solidarity is supported by scholars who think from Asia without reifying Asia and may well replace the preposition from with between through the prefix inter. Recently, Go Beng Lan reassessed this mode of theorization that has endeavored to move away from hegemonic forms of nationalism and global imperialism towards what Prasenjit Duara calls circulatory histories and dialogical transcendence. Instead of the Western encounter as the inaugural scene of the colonial critique, if critique it is that should take exception with the colonial and the post-colonial annotation, the project aspires to an affirmative ground thus the references to a possible political ontology. Of late as well, the International Journal of Asian Studies through its editor, Jin Sato, has initiated a round table on the alternating tendencies of global Asian studies and the Asianization of Asian studies. Sato and his colleague, Shigeko Sonada, Sonoda, endorse an inside out approach that stresses the active experience of those who live through globalization as agents of reflection and change and focuses on the impact such local agents have in forming the global forces themselves. 
To this point, Alan Punsalan Isaac interjects that, quote, global capital as such cannot fully capture the communal realignments and meaning-making capacities emerging from transnational kinship, regional communality, and alternative affective worlds that may not even occupy physical space. He continues that these translocal global formations forged from socioeconomic inequalities break forth life worlds that do not necessarily align with linear capitalist and national developments, end of quote. Tamara Sears, for her part, transposes such an insight to the pre-modern era, the materials of which demand us to, and I quote her, think trans-regionally, even in the context of a single node or locality, such was the case of Bodh Gaya, the pilgrimage site associated with the enlightenment of the Buddha, where a series of Tibetan, Burmese, and Chinese inscriptions attest to long-distance connections in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. In the work of Nicole Kuunying Aboitis and the Philippine Revolution, which yielded the first democratic republic in Asia, the geopolitics of the modern nation state gives way to what Aboitis delineates as an Asian place, a locus of political action that is inflected culturally and hopefully geopoetically. It is a deep and sprawling pan-Asian exploration through the urgent conjuncture of a revolution that configures quote, place in the proto-national and revolutionary thought of turn of the century Filipino thinkers and how those thinkers negotiations with and construction of the place of the Philippines, the place of Asia and the spatial registers of race connected them to their regional neighbors undertaking the same work, end of quote. I tease out this phrase, same work as the basis of a possibly coincidental Asiatic what catches my eye in this elucidation of Aboitis is a particular account of a Philippine soldier's education in Tokyo during the Pacific War and the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. The diary of Leucadio de Asis offers a picture of how the Orientalist imperialism of Japan created a cosmopolitan fantasy premised on Asian affinities. The Asis was sent to Japan as a captive of the colonial regime and a student of its culture. Aboitis points out that his detention may have exposed him to, and I quote, a picture of a new kind of modernity, at once regionalist, global, and Asian. He, mentioned in his, he mentions in his accounts a meeting with Burmese students in which he talked about Burmese independence with them and a visit to an exhibition on Thailand. The Asis was also struck by the dormitory of his compatriot Jose Abad Santos, according to him, and I quote the Asis, in this dormitory are quartered Indonesians, Annamese, and Siamese. I was impressed by Santos's room. He has a Filipino flag on the wall, several religious pictures and images, and quite a lot of English and Japanese books." End of quote. I would like to constellate this text from a diary with articulations of kindred aspirations in painting by way of difference and co-presence. I begin with difference by way of the comparative. The foremost uh, Philippine painter of the first half of the century, Fernando Amorsolo, worked within the academic realist tradition that sustained his largely picturesque imagery, which attracted the market and its collectors. His portraits were remarkable, fabled for absorbing and emanating light and atmosphere. In the depiction of the face of the Philippine woman, he fleshes out an ideal in contradistinction to typicalities exemplified by the Mongolian and the Malayan. The Philippine, therefore, is affirmed via the negation of other Asian types. And I quote a Amorsolo, my conception of an ideal Filipina beauty is one with rounded face, not the oval type often present to, presented to us in newspaper and magazine illustrations. The eye should be exceptionally lively, not the dreamy, sleepy type that characterizes the Mongolian. The nose should be of the blunt form, but firm and strongly marked. The mouth plays a very important part in the determination of a beautiful face. The ideal Filipina should have a sensuous mouth, not the type of the pouting mouth of the early days. So the ideal Filipino beauty should not necessarily be white complexion, nor of the dark brown 
color of the typical Malayan, but of the clear skin or flesh colored type, which we often witness when we meet a blushing girl, end of quote. I am intrigued by the painter's insistence on liveliness, sensuousness, and vitality in his gendered and racialized idealization of the native and potentially national woman. In conversation with this description of the face, I point to a painting by Emilio Santiago done in 1942, the first year of the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in which three colonial episodes in Philippine historical, historical life mingle. The work titled Christmas Eve dwells on a transitional moment, the eve of Christmas, a woman, presumably the mother, tends to a sleeping child. Around them are signs of the foreign that have shaped their internal world, the Catholic crash and its nativity scene, the Japanese lanterns, the American books and toys, and the customary Philippine dress of Spanish lineage. I would like to consider this coming together as a meshing that comes to terms with what Said characterizes as clusters of flowing currents, as well as the circumstances of the Kalibutan, with the term circumstances, as Mars Briones argues, referring to a series of encirclings around and within a painting, which may well be a world picture of a liminal time the eve of Christmas and the Japanese and therefore not Christian auspices with the boy probably dreaming of American liberation as revealed by the gifts to be opened in the morning. Between the artist Amarsolo and the painting is the political figure and collector Jorge Vivargas who supported the career of Amarsolo and collected Christmas Eve. He was the executive secretary of the American Commonwealth President Manuel Quezon. And at the time when the Japanese began to occupy the country in 1942, he was the highest Philippine official. From the American through the Japanese periods, he was active in government, as well as in other spheres of secularization. The University of the Philippines, of which he became a regent, the scouting and sports movements, and the collecting of all things Philippine inclusively called Filipiniana, from books and documents to stamps and coins and on to art. Across these endeavors, Vargas insinuated a collective pre preoccupation, mixing the international, the Philippine, and the Oriental in opposition to the Occidental. In his view, Western colonialism desiccated the Philippine substance, and I quote him, the importance given to the things of the spirit gave way to the excessive love of pleasure and comfort. Politics with all the concomitant evils became the order of the day. The spirit of self-sacrifice was replaced by excessive individualism and selfishness. The Filipino lost the charm, so characteristic of Oriental peoples, end of quote. The notion of Kawilihan, the name of his residential compound, viewed as an urban Pleasantville in the image of its exemplars in the United States is fundamental in the Vargas method of summoning materials. Rakawilihan roughly means fascination that shapes the time and pursuit of leisure. It signifies an avocation or even an absorption that in the case of Vargas was not disengaged from his more public persona. Fascination likewise pertains to the aesthetic or the affective the ethical demand for refinement, the devotion to detail and idiosyncrasy, and the bodily response to what is deemed beautiful, proper, rare, tasteful, or just curious or interesting. This ultimately gives rise to a certain conception of culture, at once abstract and visceral, distilled by sensitive intellection and imbibed by an avid body. In the mind of Vargas, it is culture that cobbles together, cobbles together a national heritage in the wake of a ruinous war in the Pacific, according to a 1948 document that conceptually forms the basis of the Vargas collection. The pieces were viewed as, quote, representative of a national art. The same document refers to the first catalog in 1943 that spelled out the aims of the collection, encouraging Filipino artists and assisting in their presentation of their works helping Filipinos to know and treasure our cultural heritage and contributing to the proper presentation of Philippine art. 
The generous vision of Vargas was to interlace the flesh and spirit of the Philippine in the endeavor to quote, express all the loftiness and all the greatness in, this, in his race in the creation of works of art, end of quote. This project of congealing the Filipino subject requires the accumulation of creations which become the gauge of the level of, the level of his culture. And I'm quoting him, as he puts it, the soul's hunger for the beautiful is as imperative as the needs of man's body. Vargas in his time, of in this time of reconstruction after the war had, after the war had staggeringly pummeled Manila in the magnitude of Warsaw and Dresden, located this vision amid devastation and the travails of renewal. And he spoke of the racial superiority that enables colonialism of any kind as well as the warfare that may be waged by, and I quote him, cultural guerrillas in a cultural war. That's also from him. The care and thoughtfulness that sustained fascination and the longing for culture would not have found its institutional framework if Vargas did not aspire to an intellectual project that braided culture and nation in the context of a fascination with materials in a collection. His essay titled, What is the University of the Philippines? in 1910, hints at another moment of the collective in the polyethnic community that was the university and also that was the nation. As he writes, the university as a meeting place of diverse provincial students, all interested in the various departments of human learning and resolutely working for the building up of their country means much to the Filipino people. Here are the different here are the differences of tribe, dialect, and place are obliterated. Here, the differences of tribe, dialect, and place are obliterated by the community. Uh, whose aim or worked out in common understanding. Higher ideals and broader views are infused and the studios, and the studios early learn to appreciate the benefits of a common tongue. His sympathies are widened. The Visayan learns to love the Tagalog, the Tagalog, the Ilocano and so on around the circle, end of quote. Ideas around the common sympathies and the national form the bedrock of the originally private collection that was eventually transferred to the university. Kawilihan therefore complicates Kalibutan. Kawilihan is an assemblage of evocations. It is at once real estate, residence, collection, museum. Its root word, willy, is also attentiveness, interest, penchant, fondness, liking, pleasure, enjoyment. In the early lexicon, it straddles between affection in Noceda and San Lucar, a profound deep-seated affection on the one hand, and afición in San Buenaventura, a habit, inclination, talent, or an enthusiasm. These words gravitate around love. In one Filipino translation, it is considered mataos na pagmamahal, or a lofty devotion to a beloved. If kawilihan as a concept work hovers around a particular structure of feeling for a precious belonging, then it is inevitably a cognate of the ethos of care and by extension of curation in the sense of a possession being under the care or in the custody or curiosity, the inquisitiveness about things. Because the state of kawilihan or the condition of willy is absorption, love makes sense as a discursive articulation of the word. The collector or lover loses the self, who is absorbed in the collection or abandons consciousness to the unknowing of the possessive material. In the Serrano Loctaw Dictionary, the absorbed subject is aficionado, apigado, encariñado, that is generally attached and is a connoisseur. Such cultivated attachment and connoisseurship are mediated by an object of desire. The example of the lexicographer is enigmatically allegorical and most likely moral. Hindi mawiwili ang aso kung di binibigyan ng buto. The dog will not be engaged if not given a bone. Willie therefore hinges the subject to the object to be distracted. The philosopher and collector Walter Benjamin would refer to the transfiguration of things, which mainly preoccupies the collector. The trans that informs the figuration demands having and holding as possession and property, according to Benjamin, and are related to the tactile and stand in a certain opposition to the optical. Collectors are people with a tactile instinct. 
tactile instinct. Surely this is the bone of the collection that distracts or unhinges the collector. I foreground Vargas in this discussion to index a condensation of a subjectivity that gathers and assembles by way of the agency of the collector who intuits a collective, whether in the form of nation or culture through the collection. I am interested in this intersection of the collective, which references both the person and the thing. Such an intersection takes place in the Philippines that through Vargas redistributes as an Asian place. I will tease out the strands of this transposition in the field of sports and scouting. Vargas was a pioneer in the organization of scouting in the Philippines before the Pacific War. And after the war, he was active in the National Athletic Associations and the Olympic movement. He held the second Asian games in 1954. I implicate scouting and sports as instances of harnessing the techniques of survival and citizenship as well as the mastery over the prowess of an alert and always ready and competent and adroit body. This is one moment of the buildum of the subject. The other is the emplacement of the citizen and the body in an expanded international field of both the scouting and sports movements. This is Vargas with the scouts. In a speech in 1936, Vargas states, better citizens are what we need in the Philippines at this stage of the country's history. And there is no better citizenship training devised by human ingenuity than that afforded by the Boy Scouts organization. Good citizens are not made in a single day. To make one, it takes years of constant efforts and assiduous instruction from the tender formative period of life, from early youth. If the child is the is father to the man, then the courageous, dutiful boy is father to the patriotic, law-abiding citizen. What the boy of today is, that will be the uh, what the boy of today is, that will the citizen of tomorrow be, according to Vargas. Mishka Honet notes that. On his visit around the islands in 1931 as governor, Theodore Roosevelt went to a leper colony and shook the hand of every Filipino boy scout he met, expressing the view that in the health of the child lies the strength of the nation. And the reason the boy scouts of America reached out to indigenous male youth, the future of the empire, rested not just on the happiness and health of white boys, but on the, survi on the survival of colonial boys. Honeck, Honeck continues that health, hygiene, and athleticism were also precious ideas for the Filipino advocates of scouting. He cites the Philippine scout master Lorenzo Alcantara, who believed that, and I quote Alcantara, scout, scout training contributed to the toughening of native boyhood, hiking, camping, athletic contests, crowd control, and other physical activities, and laid the foundation for a strong, efficient citizenry. To ensure their survival in a world of empires, it behooved the Filipinos to not waste a single man, but to make every boy an asset to the nation." End of quote. This foundation of imperial masculinity built up the aestheticization and technique of the Philippine body in the sensibility of the humanist and bureaucrat Vargas, civil, competitive, skillful, aware of, and around the world. As the body was inculcated as essential in the formation of a sound citizen and subject, so was it primed for competition to assert the local physique with the techniques of nation building and internationalist belonging, another articulation of the collective. Vargas was in the thick of these initiatives. The second Asian Games in Manila is particularly salient in this argument. Stefan Webner discusses how Filipino officials and their Asian collaborators attempted to use the games to promote democracy and the free world to other Asian countries, including a focus on their discourses and the inclusion of new Asian Games Federation members. The Asian Games were, was turned into an event for countries that maintained a pro-Western or neutral stance in the Cold War, according to Webner. This was one side of the story. The other side of it was tried to portray the Philippines as a free country that rejected complete American assimilation. 
end of quote. The, sover the sovereignty of the body was therefore paramount within an agonistic situation in which the said body would be affirmed in relation to opponents or fellow adversaries fit for the mutual exertion of power. At the Asian games, the locality of Philippine culture was sufficiently profiled. And simultaneously, certain symbols were deployed, certain pan-Asian symbols were deployed, like the line, youth of Asia, ever onward in friendship through sports. The collecting attitude of Jorge Vargas therefore inflected equivalent affective formations in the Philippine scout and the Asian athlete, prompting us to initiate a shift from thinking from Asia to sensing from Asia. Such an assemblage could be seen as well in, in music, or according to the Philippine artist and ethnomusicologist Jose Maceda, the musics of Asia. The latter phrase was the title of the conference held in Manila in 1966, five years after, according to Maceda, the avant-garde in music was introduced in Tokyo. In his account of the Manila event, I quote Maceda, the music of Sinakis, Bares, Bole, and Dulu was played in the same program with the traditional musics of Asia, the Chinese Nanguan men and sound, the Indian sitar as played by Ravi Shankar, the Thai Ranaad as played by Prasid Silapa Banleng, and the Philippine Kulintang as played by Amal Limuntun. Maceda further notes that the symposium may have stressed the difference in the aesthetics of two musics hundreds of years apart, but both, but both apart of the contemporary world. End of quote. In Maceda's theory, the so-called old and the so-called new converge in the avant-garde, fulfilling the desire of the body and the citizen to belong to a collective that is constituted by tradition and modernity. Maceda has written copiously on this, and I would like to focus on two ciphers of Asianness in his work, the drone and the bamboo, both of which layer the Asian place with time and sociality through everyday life and ritual. Broadly speaking, according to Maceda, and I quote, in contrast to China, the region of India and Southeast Asia was absorbed in another concept of the world, another measure of time, not a linear cause and effect entity of logic and matter, but a metaphysical world with profound respect for nature and the divine for whom temples, stone, monuments, and stupas were constructed a life replete with rituals and ceremonies in constant communication with spirits and deities with whom man corresponded to maintain an equilibrium with nature, end of quote. If we go back to the painter Fernando Amorzola's conjuration of the Philippine face and its negation of the Malayan and the Mongolian to affirm the Philippine, we see in Maceda a similar identification of Southeast Asia. With regard to the drone and its sounding and it's sounding partly through the bamboo instrument, he states that the pulse and the tambra make up the drone. They are the markers of time, not the pitch. A melody instrument may accompany the drone and sound, but its pitches move independently of the pitches of the drone instruments. This concept of drone differs from a drone in Indian music or ostinato in Western music, both of which are centered on pitch rather than pulse or tambra. End of quote. Moreover, it must be noted that the bamboo as a plant in, the Fili in Philippine folklore is mythic, being the bearer of the first woman and man to inhabit the world who alight from a node of the tall grass at which a bird would peck. Bamboo therefore is present in, in the cosmogony and a continuum in Maceda's musics. Like Jorge Vargas through the medium of Filipiniana or the compendium of Philippine information and the body of the able citizen, Maceda imagines, imagines subjectivity as a vibration within a collective surrounded by spirits. This would be elaborated in two projects, Ugnayan and Udlot Udlot. Ugnayan, which partly crystallized under Imelda Marcos's cultural patronage and the government's developmentalist and martial law strategies, sought to bring together communities through music aired via radio. Maceda recounts that, and I quote Maceda, performers used about 40 radio stations in Greater Manila to broadcast a music of 20 performed by uh, simple instruments recorded on tape and distributed to stations. Thousands of people holding radio transistor, transistors flocked in uh, playgrounds and parks within 
a radius of 50 to 100 kilometers around Manila, gathered these sound cells into small islands or forests of sounds, which varied in density according to the number of people participating in unit areas. The significance of this music lies in the use of radio stations and transistors as instruments, and in the concept that native sounds united in another combination and with many people as participants can shape the density and direction of the music, much like thousands of particles of raindrops, raindrop densities control humidity in different parts of the city. The, this, uh, the participation of thousands of people in music making in the open air is like their identification with nature, Maceda continues. A concept manifest in Javanese and Balinese paintings where men, plants, and animals are all treated as part of the jungle that envelops them. Ideas such as this can contribute to concepts of city planning, different from the technological patterns of urbanization in our modern cities, end of quote. This poetic description of Maceda references the confluence of nature and the city, the neighborhood and the mass medium of radio, as well as the phenomenology of tuning into a frequency, chancing upon a presence and a place in a world of waves. And Maceda, in another moment of the Asian comparative, brings in Javanese and Balinese paintings to amplify the subjectivity of music. The other work, Odlot Odlot, likewise anticipated a sonic public sphere. Again, I leave it to Maceda to summon this event. The work, according to him, was conceived to have a general public participate in a music for whose performance the simplest instructions were given. 800 students in an open space played or sang repeated sound types of drone patterns. One pattern was a percussion drone, a repeated sound of struck sticks. Another pattern was a continuous change from one tone color to another. And a third was a vocal sound sung over and over. The total effect was one of an identification of this music with natural sounds or the sounds produced by instruments made from products of nature. It is as if sounds in rural areas were suddenly transported into the city. The unending repetition created an impression of continuity, a concept of infinity as manifest in a native treatment of time, which is also repetitious. The permutation of hundreds of sounds without any duplication or playing together of a rhythm by any of the hundreds of participants allowed for a sound drone, which is also another aspect of continuity, end of quote. Both of these projects of Maceda happen not inside auditoria or palaces, but in communal spaces, attesting to the ability of sounds or musics to dissipate the solidities of the self-sufficient self or self-sufficient agencies like the scout, the athlete, or the collector. Just like Edward Said's idea of pulse and Nicole Kuoning Aboitis's notion of place, that is an ecology, I would like to end this keynote with the work of Singaporean artist Bani Haikal. I got acquainted with the poetry of Haikal when I heard him during the Singapore Biennale in 2019 versify on intimacy through food. This year, the exhibition titled In Our Best Interests, Afro-Asian, Afro-Southeast Asian Affinities During a Cold War, curated by Kathleen Ditzig and Carlos Quijon Jr. opened. And one of the pieces was Haikal's We Are Not Satisfied with Just Making noise. It came out of his research into the history and affect of the cultural Cold War through jazz in Southeast Asia. It is inspired by a performance in Singapore in, seven, in December 1956 by Benny Goodman, an American jazz clarinet, cla clarinetist and band leader known as the King of Swing, who led racially integrated jazz groups. For Haikal, jazz was an instrument of American Cold War diplomacy. As the US State Department circulated jazz music musicians like Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, and Duke Ellington, all musicians of color, unlike Goodman, all over the world. Barney identifies the clarinet as an exceptional jazz instrument that becomes an object of disruption characterized as the most dynamic and sounding the most human, the clarinet is capable of not only producing loud, 
piercing tones, but also gentle mellow and soothing sounds. We presented through a 3D printed replica. Goodman's clarinet is deconstructed and presented in this installation, suspended in a gray land soundscape that is an abstraction of the old badminton hall where Goodman gave his performance. Perhaps like abstract expressionism, a marker of freedom and spontaneity, jazz mystified the aesthetic autonomy of music in the Cold War with America as a source of its defense. Goodman and this band toured Southeast Asia, performing in Rangoon, Bangkok, and Phnom Penh. The program included a history of jazz, which would be portrayed by the notes as a mixture of, I quote, the tribal rhythms of African ancestors, the Creoles, the Creoles music rich with French and Spanish influences that makes for America's most valid musical form, end of quote. Such a mode of cultural diplomacy may have sought to spread the gospel of American diplomacy, democracy, but also as a retort to the systemic racism in the United States and its intense civil rights movement. Peter Kepi reminds us that, and I quote him, jazz induced people to question and reconstruct the boundaries of race, class, national identity, gender, and the modern. Michael's work complicates the Asian sonic atmosphere evoked by Jose Maceda through an avant-garde disseminated by a bamboo and radio. Haikal's citation of jazz and the geopolitical containment or false consciousness of the imitative clarinet takes us back to the body and the citizen, the athlete and the scout from Asia, who is made to imbibe a strain of sound that improvises as it improves upon the faculty of the senses and the quality of the democratic feeling and the sensible judgment. In Haikal's further research into this material, he looks at a Filipino musician who worked in Singapore as a possible face in this sequence, signaling the diasporic moment and therefore enlivening the idea of worlds contemplated by this conference and its agenda of murmuration. Indeed, the intelligence to improvise signifies virtuosity. Edward Said has remarked on virtuosity through the pianist Glenn Gould, theorizing it as a dislocation of expectation, a source of eccentricity as it is implicitly of mastery and hence of disruption in Haikal's versatile clarinet. The Asian body achieves both, achieves both across the domains of sports, scouting, and music, whether avant-garde or jazz, within mass or counterculture. Philippine musicians since the 17th century through the present or the first half of the uh, 20th century have played live for foreign audiences at sea or on land in Guam, Siam, Selangor, Sumatra, Hanoi, Saigon, Kuala Lumpur, Phnom Penh, Shanghai, Macau, Hong Kong, Singapore, Osaka, Okinawa, and Tokyo, among others. In the Munger district in India, in the 30s, for instance, a Filipino in the person of Ivan Evangelista played swing with his band and traveled all over India as a musician. Angeline de Jos <coughs> points out that this live performance of migrant Philippine artists, sorry, that this live performance of migrant Philippine artists would make guests out of strangers by quote, meeting all the affective, embodied, and flexible labor requirements entailed by interactive service work, end of, end of quote. As a way of closing this keynote, I would like to return to these worlds and their formation. As an art historian, I am interested in how collections or archives of materials are gathered and made to appear representative of a culture in annotating the history of art through collections and collectives like the nation and the body politic, it should be more productive methodologically to activate intersubjectivity through the tropes of, for instance, vibration and drone, uh, which reference both bodies as media and continuities, defying the centeredness of singular pitches through counterpoints or the play of ornamentation or even serendipitous flourishes. Part of this intersubjectivity is the risk to try out different registers from painting to music, from Jorge Vargas to Jose Maceda to Edward Said, 
Palestine and Philippine experiences from sports to scouting. Moreover, this reflection takes us through the Pacific War and the Cold War, crucial instances of the formation of nationalisms and regions in Asia. And this engages from the strictly geopolitical portals of nation states, area studies, and international relations. I mean, I use the word rework in the title in relation to art out of Asia. I think about the effective labor that materializes artistic initiation and iteration of work. It's refunctioning. But rework, I would find out, is a specific term in geology, indicating a sediment that I quote, that eroded again after deposition to be redeposited as a younger layer, an explanation for fossils of a different age occurring in the same deposition, end of quote. This particular meaning of rework excites me because it, it's, it imagines layers and depositions erosions and sediments in the scales or strata, in the thickness and interval of the Asian place. It's Kalibutan, which in the vein of curatorial because constellational thinking is really about minding the world or having the world in mind, caring about and caring for it. I would like to recover the pulses as Jose Maceda puts it in the nature of this life world as it forms from, quote, cells into small islands or forests of sounds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm back on. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly rich paper uh, and one which I'm still digesting, as I'm sure many people are as well. Uh, before I ask um, uh, a, com a question, I will also again like to remind audiences to feel free to write into the chat box and share your thoughts as well. And if you like me, you are still digesting the information, it is also fine just to simply share not necessarily have a question, but it's just to share a couple of things that may strike you or if you want things to be further elaborated. Um, and certainly that's where I'm coming from with my first um, question, which is um, I'm really interested in the way that you use language uh, and in particular how you often use words that don't seem to have um, lexical completeness. Um, that they're, they're very open, that they're, they're words that, and they're words that we don't often use in academic art history, there's, there's that, but I think it's the lexical incompleteness that I'm, I'm fascinated by, and why you are drawn to these, because I think one of the things thinking about toolkits as well, is that apart from thinking that we need anti- global um, colonial thinkers as global figures, we also need a different set of vocabularies um, mm -hmm. to put to forward our, our um, project. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you think through language and where do you see the role of this, the use of words that doesn't necessarily have fixed um, positions or ideas? Mm. That's a great question. I don't know how really to answer it, but uh, uh, it might come from my own experience as a user of language. I, I wasn't born in Manila. So the national language was, I think, my fourth language. Uh, uh, we moved around quite a lot in the central islands of the Visayas. So we moved in around three islands. So I would, I would learn uh, uh, three languages in my, in my childhood. So I think this like overlapping or uh, layering of uh, registers in, in, the, in the encounter of language would give me a different intuition about it uh, to uh, find maybe uh, uh, co coincidences or inconsistencies or idiosyncrasies that might not uh, be yielded uh, strictly by, the, by you know, the official or the, the uh, lexical definition. So I think that that kind of palimpsest interests me. Uh, it resists some form of consolidation of like information or communication. So like it resists that you know uh, mm -hmm. fixation. So and then uh, another layer, of course, would be English, which would be my, maybe my fifth language, <laughs> and I I use it professionally. I don't I don't speak English in everyday life. 
No? So uh, I, I use it professionally. So that's a, a, another layer of uh, language use that I think, uh, I don't know, maybe enlivens my attitude towards, towards language. So I mean, I mean in, in a way to, to answer your question, it's this uh, idea of learning language I mean, the kind of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there is a distance with, with, the, with the linguistic, but also some kind of intimacy with uh, uh, possible idiosyncrasy that I, I, I notice uh, within the, the pragmatic sense of, of, of language, which is language in use, yeah. And I think that was the inspiration of Kalibutan. Yeah. Right. I mean, it often it has this, um, what I love about Kalibutin, and I'm still trying to, to figure it out as a concept of a, a roundness and awareness of that which goes within and outside the object of what we're thinking about. So we're always in circulation. I mean, it's such an intantalizing idea. Um, and it really does go against art history in the way that we think about art history, right? Which we often deal with things as, um, even if we don't want to, we often place them in static moments. We deal with objects that can be static. Um, we tend to allocate um, the artworks into moments of making that renders them static as well. Whereas what you're actually saying is this, this constant moving of, in some ways, of being rather than belonging, would you say? Mm -hmm. And also unknowing. Mm. You know? and one part of it is consciousness, mm. uh, a sense of being in the world and performing the task of presence, of course, but uh, the other part of it is the maybe the unknowingness or the untranslatability that you do not know. Yes. And, and okay. there's some, yeah, and there's something about that that's kind of where research takes. We can always argue that's kind of where research can take place too, is in how we try to grapple with the mm -hmm. unknowing or the that which cannot be known, right? Yeah, yeah, or um, translate easily, yeah. And then there's Kali, Ka, Ka, okay, I'm going to pronounce Kawali Han itself, and Wali itself is this, is is almost this idea of desire. But I, the way that you were also talking about it in in connection with Vargas, there's also a desire to anticipate a future as well. Mm -hmm. And would you say that's also part? This is also where Kalabutan and Kali, uh, Kawali Han has a sense of difference. Am I mispronouncing it? I'm sorry if I am. It's okay, it's Kawilian. But uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, Vargas was anticipating a some, some kind of a cohesion or a wholeness after the fragmentation of war. Mm. And so to some extent he, allegor he allegorized this, uh, this uh, wholeness through the collection that uh, through, by piecing together fragments of art and culture in, in, in in, in one place, uh, stamps, coins, books, and everything, it, everything pertaining to the Philippines, the Filipiniana, we would be able to recover uh, a certain wholeness of culture. So he was anticipating that future uh, mediated through a, a collective ethic. Mm. Yeah. But uh, what is interesting about Vargas is, was that he was also a political figure. So it was not as if he was isolated from the uh, production of a nation state. He was part of it too. So quite a, a rare intersection of um, a subjectivity who, who anticipated the future through culture and also through, through governance. Politics, yeah. yeah. I do have a couple of uh, comments from the uh, audience from the floor, which I'd like to share. Uh, this one comes from Simone Will. Um, who said, I love the way that Patrick moved from speaking about rather conservative paintings, sports events, to connection to be drawn to them is something very intriguing. And I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit about that as well. Uh, okay, maybe for another seminar, but- uh, <laughs> It is. <laughs> maybe, just to say, maybe just to say that uh, in as a, uh, speaking to the uh, concerns of the conference, I wanted to look at different sorts of materials different sorts of objects to be studied in relation to, to, to art history. And this, uh, these other materials were, were also quite organic in the, in the practice of Vargas. Uh, it's not as if I imposed, on, imposed them on, 
on my discussion with Vargas because he also he was really part of this sports movement and also the scouting movement. I just wanted to create um, those involvements uh, to to bring those involves, involvement into the context of the formation of culture. So uh, yeah. the, the production of a subjectivity or or the the body that you know that is ready also to uh, to to uh, partake of this culture. Yeah. Uh, there's um there's also a couple of other questions which I'm going to kind of kind of combine them as well, um, and it goes back to the uh, question of Kalabutan and Kawilihan. Uh, and this comes from Ming and can, um, who said, ask, can you please tell us how you imagine the relationship between Kalabutan and Ka Kalawalihan? Kalawalihan. Yeah. And then to add on top of that, how is the use of these vocabularies able to posit Asia and Asian art regionally and not just nationally? Mm. Big questions, no? Um, mm -hmm. Again, paper worthy. <laughs> It's just that uh, the, the Kawilihan reflects the, uh, both uh, speak to worldliness, no, worldliness. Uh, Kalibutan uh, pertains to the world itself and also the consciousness of the world, no? and also maybe the unknowingness uh, in relation to the world. And Kawilihan uh, speaks to the, the worldly pursuit, the worldly pursuit of possessing objects, collecting materials, uh, and so on and so forth. So it uh, takes us to this world of mater materiality. Huh? So this, uh, uh, also this fascination, this uh, subjectivity of, of, of possessing. So I, uh, with the two, Kalibutan and, and Kawilihan, I'm trying to develop a, like a theory of the collective, the, co the theory of the collective through a collecting practice that was quite expanded because it reached out to the scouting movement and also the sports movement and, and of course politics. And also I must note that Vargas was from the Visayas. Yeah, so I'm sure he knew what Kalibutan meant. Yeah. Right, so it can be. And so just to follow up, it's how do you use the posit Asia and Asian art regionally if you had to do so? How will, once you have this, thinking through this theory, how would you see it perhaps mutate in other areas when you expand it geographically? Oh, uh, largely through, I think the, the Pacific War. I think the Pacific War is uh, uh, an important theater to stage this movement outside, huh? uh, movement beyond, beyond the nation. And uh, the, through the quote of, uh, of the asses, no? I mentioned that mm -hmm. he, was, he was exposed to this kind of, uh, in a way, transnationality in, in Tokyo. So I think that might be an interesting place to revisit the Japanese interregnum mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia. That might have, uh, because it's quite interesting, the mix of Orientalism and, uh, uh, Orient and Orientalism and also nationalism. And, uh, and, and of course it implicates the idea of America, of America. So uh, I think that theater is uh, quite an intersection, the, the Pacific War and then the, the, the coming back of the Americans no, to, to, reclaim, to reclaim the region. And that might be interesting. The tangent of course was uh, Maceda, Maceda the, 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 music, the composer and also the musicologist, but it was uh, some kind of methodological maneuver to, to, to pick up also from Said's counterpoint uh, mm -hmm. argument and to uh, further expand the notion of, of Asia and introduce the sonic uh, and, and the migrant as a, a part of the mix, yeah. I mean, that's definitely another parallel or another um, kingship that I was seeing you doing with the migrants and the sonic was a really interesting, uh, uh, you know, another interesting vector point, which I think can also expand what you're doing. Um, I'm 
have uh, one, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to read through all the questions as well because they're coming in fast and furious now, which is great. Uh, and this uh, comes from Katerina Santiago. He wants uh, to ask, what surface for me as I listen to Patrick is another word, which is Kalibunga. Kalibunga, and I'm going to spell it in case I mispronounce it, K-A-L-I-B-U-G-A-N, as oh, desire. Yeah. I, I miss, I'm fairly sure I mispronounced it. I'm sorry, Patrick. As that yeah, concept yeah. that is in between and surrounding as well. Um, the notions of Kawili, Kawili Han as to be related to entertainment and distraction and Kalabutan as wholeness that is in constant flux. The way that desires are ever shifting and changing are both internal and personal impulse and it's external and cultural. And of course, the worldliness of desire is something that might be an important part of a conversation about Asia and our collective desires, um, given as well desire as flowing currents. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, mm. that, uh, I mean, to, to foreground the erotic, no? to, to foreground the erotic, to, because Kalibuga <laughs> is uh, erotic or maybe the libidinal, maybe. Uh, so to foreground the erotic uh, and uh, calibrate the epistemic. No? So mm -hmm. it's methodologically, that was also my point, no? to, <clears throat> to create, uh, to eroticize, to eroticize the uh, met methodology uh, through these impulses like, like sound or the body of the scout, uh, the energy of the athlete, yeah, and also the, just the, you know, the curiosity of the collector. Right, and I, and I slightly, and again, there's, um, to follow up with that one, it can, this idea of desire or erotic, can it not also mean confusion, uh, which is what it means in most Visayan languages, and this is from Michael Carlo Vallis. Yeah, that's also a good point. So, you know, it becomes richer that way. <laughs> I know this is a sedimentary building of, of meaning. A real rework, yeah. <laughs> real rework of, of, of Kalibutan. It's, uh, yeah, it's confusion. Again, going back to the, uh, the unknowingness that is also uh, embedded in Kalibutan. Right. And then one, um, sorry, there's one, again, coming through again, if Kalibutan and Kawali, Kawili, uh, Kawili. Kawali Han, aroundness and awareness were cultural concepts exhibited by people of pre-colonial Philippines. So that is maybe why it's so alien to Western conception, which also tends to emphasize the tangibility of the art object. Would you agree with that? Could, could be, could be. Uh... That might be an interesting trajectory to uh, to to situate the discussion uh, outside modernity because now it is within that mm -hmm. uh, through, through you know through Vargas and Maceda and even Said no? so it's within that self consciousness uh, we can move maybe uh, back or beyond or outside that uh, that context of the modern or modernity and uh, try to explore more further uh, what this word could could yield and uh, well in a way maceda would also could signal that through you know the this distinct musicological character of, of philippine music uh, that is based on the drone and the bamboo so that, that but, but Maceda would enfold those into the modern as well. So uh, it's in so some I, ways you can't escape the modern then um, in thinking through these ideas. Yeah, correct. Um, but you can maybe unhinge a bit, mm. uh, unhinge, which is a uh, distraction, no? uh, which is part of, 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 of Kawilihan. And uh, that's why in the Philippine case, complicates the, the colonial project. Mm. For me. Uh, that's why when I participate in discussions about the decolonial, I'm a bit more 
cautious and circumspect because the uh, Philippine colonial experience was, was quite different. Uh, the, the, the level of imbrication. Right. I mean, it, you can see how it mutates through things such as the native, the clothing. I mean, everything just becomes a little messier, as it were. Yeah. So I don't know how, at which point, you know, you detach that. Right. So that's why maybe it's interesting, the Philippine case uh, should, should be, I mean, I mean, we should turn to the Philippine case to complicate the decolonial argument. Well, this then may be a good time to perhaps, this is more a comment um, uh, from Sahib, um, who said this, picking up some threads from the recent Asia forum where Patrick mentioned his distance from the great traditions and the post-colonial, this paper felt like it was positioning towards de-imperializing history. Would you mm. agree? Yeah, if it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, only if we can theorize more, maybe more sensitively, uh, the prefix D. I think that's what is usually that that part falls through the cracks. No? Yeah. What, what do we mean by that prefix? Inter. D. Yeah. Or D, D, imperializer the colonized, but what do we exactly mean by that? So I think we, it's about time, it's, it's time, I think high time to, to look into that prefix when we, we try to theorize whatever noun is placed beside it. I think that's a good point. We have completely ran over time. Um, but I think it was in, in, it was well worth it. That was uh, incredibly rich, and I think we have we'll probably get more questions in the afternoon. Uh, and this was um, this was fabulous. It was absolutely a, a, a mind-boggling kind of paper. So thank you very much, Patrick, for giving us such rich material to start this the last of this panel. And we will re come back. Uh, we'll take a short break and come back with the papers with the afternoon paper and then there will be another q a where you can have another chance to grill patrick further about his paper too thank you very much everyone thank you for the moderation it will more than welcome so it's a 15 minute break and we will return at 1 45. thank you very much thank you
we still have a couple of minutes, um, so I'll wait for that uh, while people join us in a few. Okay, so it's 1.45. We have a lot to do today uh, to go through. We have three papers this afternoon and four speakers. So I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers. And if it's okay with the conveners, I'm just going to introduce each of the speakers as their papers come up. So the speaker of our first paper this afternoon, Subcontinent, Diasporas, Futurisms and World Building, is Amrita Dalu, a curator and researcher based in London. She provides support structures for emerging British artists through commissioning, editorial projects, creating artistic networks, and intergenerational learning spaces. Her current research examines care, healing, and ethno-futurist discourse within arts education, exhibition making, and professional developments for artists. She is the lead artist of the Candom Arts Centre 2018-19 uh, Peer Forum, she currently hosts the post of Assistant Curator, International Arts at Tate Modern London, where she is part, uh, working as part of the curatorial team for the forthcoming Lubanian Hamid's exhibition and catalogue. <clears throat> Sorry. She is on the board of AN and Arts Night and is the co-editor with Priya J of a forthcoming publication that is emerging from Stuart, the communal design and publishing platform and Neva. Let me pass over to Amrita. Thank you. I will now share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yes, that's working well. Thanks, Amrita. Okay, great. Okay, thank you everyone so much for being here today. And I also just want to say, Patrick, your keynote just floored me and there's so many connections so I'm really really excited to uh, unpack them further with you. So before I begin I would like to extend my deepest thanks to the artist Timali Singh Soin whose work and concepts have really shaped and framed this research and she's been so incredibly generous with her time um, speaking with me a lot and also inviting me to add my own images and concepts to expand this work. So I'd also like to echo the acknowledgement at the beginning of the artist's book, We Are Opposite Like That, which expresses gratitude and respect towards the natural element of ice. To ice, our elder, our sage, our astrologer, our shaman, our timekeeper, our politician, our philosopher, our teacher, our protector, our folly. So, to introduce my work as a curator, often I work closely with artists who investigate the impacts of the body as a vessel for inherited histories and what it means for the body, particularly in the case of diasporic communities, to be caught in the aftermath of a traumatic event or history that occurred generations before we even arrived. And over this past year and a half specifically, my research has entered into a very particular space, and this has been shaped a lot by the many, many conversations I've had with artists and curators looking at the generative and imaginative space that has been carved out by many ethno-futurist movements and aesthetic thoughts, as well as observing the, the case for a few of us, our reorientation towards the natural landscape and an embrace of a more geological understanding of time. 
And what happens when you bring all of these elements together to create new artistic methodologies, which support, particularly for diasporic subjects, the imagining and remapping of geographies based on connectivity, intuition, and cross-continental relationships, moving towards bridging the ruptures caused by the Western cartographic principles. So on an individual level, I've been drawn to the hope and the optimism that a futurist aesthetic language can provide, particularly after experiencing this past year and a half of deep pain and continuous grief across many different levels. So I've been leaning on a futurist thinking to chart, to restore, and even reconceive the complex relation between myself and my ancestral homeland of the Indian subcontinent. And through this thinking, I connected with the practice of Himali Singh Soy, whose 2018 manifesto entitled Subcontinentment announces a South Asian futurism, which is responsive. It listens and shapeshifts according to the spectral whispers, ancestral rhythms, and invisible communications that are generated between the polar regions and the subcontinent. But before I get into the details of the manifesto, it's, an impo it's important to introduce the expansive multidisciplinary practice of Himali Singh Soin. So the artist is based across London and Delhi and works across text, performance, sound and moving image. Her practice centers metaphors from the natural environment as well as outer space. And these are used to construct speculative cosmologies that reveal non-linear entanglements between human and non-human life. So this poetic methodology, as she names it, has allowed me to see from a very different perspective the nonlinear entanglements between London, Asia and the diasporic spaces beyond, as her work draws from many different modes of knowledge, production and circulation, from the scientific to intuitional and indigenous and alchemical processes of uh, knowledge. So through my research, I was really drawn to the interdisciplinary project, We Are Opposite Like That which comprises mythologies for the global poles, told from the non-human perspective that has witnessed deep geologic time, the ice. In 2017, the artist completed residencies in the Antarctic Peninsula and the Arctic Circle in Svalbard, and through this experience became very drawn to the vast glacial landscapes and recognizing them as these incredible archives. And she started to think about the kinds of stories the kinds of ghostly traces and even warnings that are stored in these archives, archives that have existed long, long, long before humans were even a thought on this planet. So in the filmic strand of this project, the artist embodies an alien-like character wearing an emergency blanket and the shimmer of this foil reflects and reflects, refracts the light of the white, white landscape. And so we follow this solitary figure who is wandering and looking for a home. On this journey, the character finds herself in and amongst receding ice caps, Soviet ruins, old whalers graves, and then she finds herself in a coal mine where her brown body is reflected back onto her. And in that moment, a heat, an energy is generated between the two, and then a kinship is formed between the character and the landscape. In this moment, the ice is recognized as an agent of resistance, as we understand that the landscape has resisted extractionism for a very, very long time. It is from this fieldwork in the polar circles that the artist devised the manifesto Subcontinentment, which also forms part of these fictional ice archives. So I want to share with you all the opening standards stanzas of the manifesto. But before I do that, I think it's interesting to note that the very confrontation between the artist and the overbearing whiteness of the polar landscape is what provided the canvas upon which to build a South Asian futurism. But then it's this disconnect at, which creates an in-between space becomes the place of reckoning and an understanding between the two. So I'll begin. Subcontinentment. South Asian futurism does not fantasize about a future because it cannot isolate the future from the past. It fantasizes about a life in between. It wishes to grab language by its horns, grab the English language by its horns and bring it off its yeses and nos and everythings and nothings and hang it out to dry in the equatorial sun in the middle of infinity. Its locus is entangled, material and spiritual, subliminal and subversive and submissive at once bipolar. 
South Asian futurism is a witness to the ash warmth of the morning when the newspapers have smacked the ironclad gates and a few are lost in trees or transit. South Asian futurism dismisses its title, denouncing South Asia as a universal region without specificity, denouncing futurism as an accomplice to the violence that comes with acceleration. South Asian futurism would like to call itself subcontinentment, a skew portmanteau of subcontinent and contentment, an idealistic futurism that is scientific but does not believe in science as a solution. Its science fiction does not project a dystopia despite the carbon. It wants an alchemy of knowledges. It wants rumors, humors, hypotheses. It wants ancient imaginaries and everyday erasures. It wants to rest. Where happiness is fleeting, our contentment finds rest. Not rest like stillness, but the kind of rest in music, a held pause, an interval with a pedal down, or like a lily pad floating flat against water, an absolute zero coated in an armor of wax, repelling the too muchness of life, lightness born by horizontality. We are the poetry of brown bodies. We take your criticality and raise you immediacy. Subcontinentment says it is a part of and apart from. Subcontinentment says we are one body that is killed over and over again if we are not cautious. The spectre of freedom in a world which cannot be reversed but reprinted in the form of 2000 rupee notes. Purple hearts hatching life on Mars, where money will be cosmic and Gandhi will look through lotus colored glasses and see temples built on tombs, praying palimpsests of pulverizing precarity, praying to the gods of geometry, their indeterminate equations, to the reflection of light by the moon, to suspension, apparition, gravitation, levitation, indirect vision. So I'll leave it there for the moment. So subcontinentment has provided me with this very open space upon which to project my own imagery and reimagine ancestral lineage across space and time. The artist presence is dissented and we do understand that we are entering to this conversation with ice itself and history under erasure. And so the emphasis is placed on the we as that is who is um, addressed rather than the I or the you. So we understand that the potential future can be rooted in a we across both human and non-human networks and time. And so the use of both the musical and natural metaphors in, the, in this proposition of a future reminds me of the artist David Madala and the importance of metaphors and the use of boundless imagery within his practice in order to inspire others, making them feel sensuously alive and connected with all of the life force that surrounds them. And so when he spoke about the audience coming into contact with these metaphors, he said, your mind will be able to grasp the mysteries of life. A metaphor has the capacity for continuous growth. It grows all the time you think about it. It transcends the elements which constitute it. And another key natural image evoked in this manifesto is the lily pad and the flat horizontal structures that they embody. This image leads me to think of the rhizome, again, structures that have no singular root or center as a way to embrace the interconnectedness between us and to better understand our relation with the land, which is always shifting and changing. And so the manifesto and our reading of it should act in a similar way. This botanical metaphor was also adopted by the thinker Edouard Glissant, whose writings encouraged us to recognize humans as rhymes, rhizomes in relation to one another in this shared open space. So I do feel that subcontinentment supports Glissant and his application of the rhizome into the framework of archipelagic thought, seeing archipelagos as land masses that are rhizomatic in nature, which also don't have uh, uh, unique centers or roots. Just as rhizomatic structures develop shoots that reach out to one another, subcontinentment encourages us as people to do the same, to learn to turn outwards towards others so that we can see South Asia across different geographical, geological, historical, social dimensions that are all entangled. And this enables us to let go of the belief that one particular ethno-religious community has a single central point of origin and therefore claim to a specific territory. 
So when we take a step back, we see that we are engaged in an interrelated network of multiplicities. And this all supports the artist's speculation around a post-national identity, what it looks like and how it functions. The manifesto itself is very self-reflexive. It problematizes the term South Asian futurism from the very get-go and it opts for a new identification. I think this is really important because I think it could prevent the fetishization of a South Asian futurism, particularly within the circuits and the systems of an art world. Distancing itself from the modernists and the Italian futurists, it condemns the violence associated with acceleration and that celebrated obsolescence. It refuses the ism in futurism, that association with rigidity and a static moment in time. And I think it makes you remember that you're, you're dealing with ice, which is a form of water, and that it will shift its um, shape and form over time. And we must be prepared for when the glaciers break loose and melt into the oceans. How are we going to reckon with our archives then in that moment of changing shape and potential loss? Instead, it, it, cho it chooses to align itself with futurist movements born out of the global south. Calling itself subcontinent, meant its future outlook for a subcontinent is one that can be rooted in joy and abundance, a powerful source of resistance pulling us through very difficult moments. So when the artist and I first met, last summer in 2020, we really did bond over our shared interests and investment in futurisms in various moments in time. And recognizing that their role could be in inspiring an optimism in historical moments of deep despair. So I shared with the artists as well that at that time, and I still am, I was involved in developing a collaborative new futurist movement called Dad Futurism with a Somalian artist, Salmanor, and Afro-Carib cultural producer, Helen Starr. And we were looking to create a multi-layered practice which dissented European discourse and embraced the intersectionalities of technology, arts, ritual, and time. And in the same vein of subcontinentment, the very foundations of this movement look to the eco ecological entanglements between our ancestral homes of South Asia, East Africa, and the Caribbean. And in her research, the incredible Helen Starr, and I still to this day don't even know how she managed to find this, but found that a desert sandstorm which hailed from Somalia encircled the globe within the horse latitudes, which are located about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. And this sandstorm brings the vital nutrients to the poor soils of the Caribbean and Amazonian basins. And then they come around and they shape the crucial monsoons of India. So here, um, Helen was able to track this sandstorm and see that there are these connections that between us that relate to the ecological relations that have existed long, long, long before any kind of trade route between these territories were developed and exploited by the West. So here, um, and with both of the artists' permission, I've layered the Dard Futurist sandstorm on top of the subcontinent mentalists glaciers. And I think the images really speak to each other and feel very in sync because I think it's indicative of how these emergent futurist movements or the ones I've spoken about today and how they're developing are really looking to what Sing Soin calls the ancient telepathic communications between the Earth's geological sites. And these natural rhythms and cycles become agents of decolonization that are centered in our artworks and art worlds. So when I try to connect this all to a thinking around what a diasporic South Asian futurism could look like, and I return to subcontinentment here, I'm drawn to the oppositional antagonistic forces that are conjured by this manifesto as a foundation for a psychic diasporic landscape upon which to build new futures. The embrace of the in-between, a land which represents neither past nor future, but a cyclical motion between the two. Yes, antagonist, antagonistic forces meet, but they don't try to overpower one another. They combine and they meet and they give space to infinite possibility and transformation. 
The South Asian futurism as this in-between space serves as a useful metaphor within which to develop a diasporic aesthetic language as it indicates the many crossings and transgressions that these artists whose work I'm interested in are dealing with. For example, the crossings of boundaries that are geopolitical, gender-based, and even caste-based. Just like the geological landscapes that we are in dialogue with, our identities as diasporic subjects are constantly shifting and moving, and so it's important to create theoretical and aesthetic ground which acknowledges that. And so the next stage of developing this research is to consider the artists across Britain and Asia that are using different kinds of aesthetic modes, but also hope and joy to build new worlds. So this slide is just you know, the start, it's a little teaser. And it's just a group of artists that I think do subscribe to some of the themes that I've spoken about today. So their practices don't necessarily deal with the return to the motherland, but instead it's about conceiving a new imagined space within which a solidarity and kinship between artists can be developed. And I don't unfortunately have time today to go into their individual practices, but I think it's interesting to note that there is this move towards employing sonic and new technologies, and in some cases, 3D modeling technologies to disrupt memories of a homogenous subcontinent. And through their practices, they each call for a new kind of mapping, one that allows for diasporic storytelling to layer onto the cultural palimpsest envisioned by Sing Soin's manifesto. So to conclude, I think it's really important to note that the context in which the artist wrote the manifesto was extremely different to the one that we find ourselves in now. Sing Soin wrote the piece in 2018, and when I look at this retrospectively, I think that there's a real prophetic nature to the manifesto because it predicted the brutal consequences of the policies then freshly set by the Modi government, particularly that of demonetization and its impact on rural communities. Also, the impact of the incessant architectural campaign, building new temples, new government buildings as a vehicle to declare an ethno-religious dominion domination, sorry, in India. In a recent conversation with the artist, we both acknowledged that the contentment in subcontinentment feels extremely difficult to commit to in this moment in time. But when I reflect on my changing relationship with the text, I realized that it has evoked this sensitivity and uh, I guess a better awareness of the trauma that is constantly flaring in the world around cases that relate to spatial and land injustice, thinking about the farmer strike in North India, as well as the ongoing occupation of Palestine. Can we use subcontinentment as a generous framework to reimagine spatial politics and equity? We both acknowledged that the manifesto needs to be added to in order for it to maintain its role as a caretaker for an archive in loss, to maintain its resilience and its ability to absorb and reflect back onto us the grief we are collectively experiencing. However, this isn't necessarily a difficult task as the manifesto is so spacious. The artist has intentionally left pauses breaks and many generous open spaces upon which we can project our own images of hope and futurity. Subcontinentment is a present living archive for our future selves, ongoing, open-ended and ready for future generations to build onto it using our own mythologies and new forms of testimonies. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, a great paper. And I will also encourage um, our listeners to start thinking of questions in our Q&A sessions to follow, because I'm sure there were plenty. And there were certainly a lot of connections between Amrita's uh, paper and what Patrick just said. Um, there was just so much crossover. So I think this afternoon's conversation is going to be very exciting. But let me introduce our second paper, uh, which is entitled Contesting Publics and Art Education in Pakistan. And our speakers today are Farida Batu and Sir Jalil. Farida is an independent artist, researcher, and educationist. She received her bachelor's in fine arts from the National College of Arts, master's by research in art history and theory from the College of Fine Arts at the University of New South Wales, and a PhD from the Center of Media Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, um, SOAS. 
in London. She has been teaching since 1997 and currently heads the Department of Cultural Studies at the National College of Arts Lahore and has authored a book, Figure the Popular and the Political in Pakistan. She was involved in many art projects and community workshops for awareness raising among, among women communities in several urban and rural areas of Pakistan and also conducted cultural and political dialogue among different communities. She presented papers and presentations at international conferences and workshops, and she has also exhibited extensively in many international and local solo and prestigious group shows. She is an active member of Awami Art Collective, which aims to use art in public spaces to generate a discourse of peaceful coexistence. She is also joined by Sia uh, Jali, who is a visual artist, researcher, writer, and a PhD candidate. She obtained a BFA in 2006 and an MA Honours in Visual Arts from the National College of Arts Lahore. An urge to find midpoints between material and surreal, practical and theoretical, connects her with diverse media and archive. Doing public art in Lahore as a member of the Awami Art Collective since 2015 further support this subversion. Most recent curiosities are Indian soldiers in World War II through personal archives, entertainments in times of restraint, memory archive, and proving stardust dis, uh, scientifically to discover cosmic unity. She is a lecturer in the Department of Cultural Studies at the National College of Arts in Lahore, and she has also participated in various group shows, art research projects, and contributed to publications, both nationally and internationally. Her solo shows, Stray Reflections, in 2018 and 19, was created at the Javid Mansell House Museum of the National Poet, Alama Akbar. She presented her co-authored paper, The Sky Drew Some New Lines, on the case studies of Awami Art Collective projects at the Urban Heritage Conference in Berlin in March 2017. Please join me in welcoming our second uh, set of papers. Uh, just to say to everyone as well that Sarah and Farida have sent their paper in um, pre-recorded for now, uh, but they will be here for the Q&A. And we're just going to share a YouTube link as well. If your internet is slow and buffering, you can watch there, but please do come back afterwards for the third paper and the Q&A. Thank you. On 14th August 2020, a group of gardeners under the leadership of their artist horticulturist launched a huge public sculpture to celebrate their love and devotion to the national poet Muhammad Iqbal. The sculpture was made by collecting materials from the park's resources and regular visitors' interest in the, uh, in the project. While it was not financially commissioned by the local government, it was envisioned to add attraction to the park by making a selfie point, which it was until the fate on the fateful day of February 2nd, 2021 at 9.49 a.m. After six months of installation, a tweet by one of the most important journalists, mainstream media anchor, who attacked present government's member, who happened to be the poet's grandson, by stating, do you know whose sculpture is this? Does it resemble poet of the East at all? Your government has commissioned this sculpture on nepotism and installed it in Gulshan Ek Valpar. I feel devastated by looking at this sculpture. This tweet went viral in a few hours and opened floodgates of netizens' reaction from other cities and countries, demanding the local government of Lahore to take immediate action against an object of insult to the national poet. Interestingly, most of the Twitterati did not see the per uh, sculpture in person in the park. Awami Art Collective, however, issued a statement in support of the makers of this sculpture, stating, this sculpture has an innocent appeal of pure love of people, which is original in its shape, materiality, execution, and size. The amazing effort should not, this amazing effort should not be discarded. Instead, we must hail the makers of this sculpture and own this piece as an original public art. This sparked interest in many artists and they started to come forward in support of the sculpture after we, the Awami Art Collective posted this uh, message on social media. 
and many revise their early statement of seeing a piece of disgrace to a more powerful expression by local gardeners quote unquote which should be recognized the sculpture was nonetheless disinstalled and we was taken away probably destroyed but it generated a controversy where people were divided and left with many questions like who was and were the makers of this sculpture and would it have would have it would have been made a difference if the sculpture was commissioned to an artist if the issue of resemblance was the key issue then what about numerous public sculptures in the city and others which do not have any resemblance and in fact are installed in a much ridiculous manner and very careless manner why they don't get this reaction is it a matter of aesthetics this juncture with the past and current crea current creative force uh, practices is it an issue of class academic hierarchies or hegemonic control over public space and art many social media comments on the ikbal statue revered a viral post of a local academically trained sculptor creating national sculptures with full academic realistic protocol there were numerous comments which condemned the gardener sculpture and compared it to childlike drawings and the ancient king priest there was all, there were also those who stressed that only someone who is trained to do something should be granted the liberty to do it this commentary is not the focus of this interrogation but it raises an important question on the ideal of our local wami colleague maria khan created a meme on her comic illustration page where our own indus valley ancestors were seen in appreciation of the statue of the king priest khan satirically asked through her meme what if the king priest was made today would it have been criticized or removed one wonders what happened in the history of south asian art and pedagogy to manufacture a public aesthetic or a power politics which forced an execution of an alama ikbal sculpture which did not meet societal artistic ideals the fact that during the whole week of heated debate over this sculpture in social and mainstream media the makers were continued to be referred as malis meaning the gardeners but no one referred to the makers with names these gardeners took the initiative of making something attractive for people popular selfie point in the public park using park's waste material and visitors contribution this dismissal of artist identity reflect on the issue of class and power in pakistani society it might be useful here to look for a complex and nuanced understanding of the high and low art practices and their political ramification in gramsci's hegemonic model the popular practices are considered low in status or the popular public sphere catering to popular consumption as is evident in the case of sculpture of uh, alama ikbal which remained a popular selfie point for the local visitor for few months until was targeted by media to serve political motives but nonetheless continued with hasty assumptions about the aesthetics of the sculpture and dismissed it due to the social status and location of these practitioners which was outside the four walls of the white cube the established institutions of high art in the gramscian model of hegemony the state takes the uppermost position from where it controls art and culture to construct its own ideology which is reminiscent in the commissioning of numerous sculptures of founders of pakistan in public spaces the state funded sculptures have also been ridiculed by public and artist due to their stylistic issues and poor workmanship but the state never felt under the pressure to remove those pieces this further raises a question that which sculpture will survive in public space for instance uh, uh, for for a few instances of uh, removing sculptures in the public space in the past history of pakistan needs a deep analysis where a majestic statue of queen victoria installed in 1902 in front of the punjab assembly lahore was removed after the inception of pakistan and was replaced by a bronze replica of the holy quran because the islamic summit was to take place that year the statue of leading hindu engineer sir ganga ram who was to his credit some of the city's iconic buildings like national college of arts and ganga ram hospital was attacked and damaged by extremist groups 
while we saw the removal of horse sculptures from um, a an elite residency, residential uh, housing society, public square, other house horse sculptures continue to adorn the public squares. The extremely high priced commission pieces in Lahore's uh, elite residential societies continue to be the center of attraction for large public and are not questioned by the media. The continuous presence of the painted images of national heroes and political leaders on the painted trucks as part of art truck aesthetics surround us and people continue to enjoy them despite them not painted in western tradition of portraiture with resemblance. Within the hegemony of creative industry, the popular vernacular cultural expressions are relegated to the lowest level, enabling the popular expression to continue its visibility in the public sphere. How do we then understand the idea of public, publics and the public art within the hegemonic modes of direct and indirect control? The conscious decision of not teaching art and cultural heritage in schools by the military regimes of Zaul Haq continues with the colonial project of disconnection with the past. The disjuncture with the indigenous expression of arts in the public domain was once severed by the narratives written by the colonial project of archaeological discoveries, education, and cultural modernization. Placement of Gandhara sculptures, for instance, in Lahore Museum was one such venture where sculptural past was studied within the four walls of the museum outside of its geocultural and religio-historical context. As the quote starts, the use of these sculptures were being deciphered less to learn about India and more about rediscovery of colonial Western self, quote ends, states Shaila Bhatti. She further elaborates that they were not symbolizing a mysterious or exotic other, but seemed to be a missing part of Western history that needed to be reclaimed intellectually and physically and was being assisted by the rise of classical archaeology as a modern mode of scientific inquiry in India. The presence of high art sculpture within the institution of museum and low art in the public sphere reflects the continuous fight of the public for their public space that was never lost. According to Martin Zibraki in his essay Beyond Public Artopia, public art is perceived by public. The public art response is dependent on the educational background of people and important to public art perception. Quote, in human geographical research on perception, much attention is paid to how the real world is directly or indirectly read as an environmental message and filtered through the perceiver senses, brain and personality, and culture be, being attitudes, norms, and values that are derived from the perceiver's cultural background and competences. This leads us to excavate a selective range of South Asian pedagogical influences, just as an attempt to understand the plurality of aesthetic perceptions in the region. An aux oxymoronic scape may be the center of these influences as West and East, academic and traditional, colonial or co post-colonial, resistance or acceptance morph through the varied timelines and regions. The 1920s and 30s in Lahore had Mio School of Arts, Bahabesh Chandra Sanyal, introduce individual expression with observation uh, with live and nude model studies. Later introduced, later expanded through Sanyal's Lahore School of Fine Arts, 1937, A.R. Chuktai, 1899 to 1975, acquired and pushed the Bengal School to his own evolved Persian aesthetic after he met Gupta around 1915. This cosmopolitanism can also be seen and understood in Rup Krishna's 1901 to 1968 art and theory pursuits. Rup Krishna's res residence above um, the bookshop Rama Krishna and Sons at Anarkali, Lahore, was the center for art aesthetic discussions. Krishna's international training at the Ecole des Books uh, Arts in Paris and Royal College of Arts London, along with other, uh, with earlier influence of 
Abinder Nath Tagore and training under Nandalal Bose at Shanti Niketan, Bengal, created a space for avant-garde thinking and work where evolution and change was crucial to art. The art practitioners from our collective have lived in Lahore. Majority of us have our initial academic training from the National College of Arts, Lahore, which was Mew School of Arts earlier in colonial India. Resistance and deconstruction, subversion and collaboration has also been inherent in this aesthetic trail derived from this institution. From poet artist Ravinder Nath Tagore's and social scientist uh, Benoit Kumar Sarkar's progressive artist group 1947 in Bombay, which stressed on universal aesthetics, internationalism and interdependence as integral to art. Two, an understanding of the 1850s and 1860s when Britain became interested in the pedagogy and mastery of Indian art with institutional focus at South Kissington, especially after the East India Company's contribution to the 1851 Great Exhibition in Britain. Consequently, in 1853, Sir Charles Trevelyan proposed a British, uh, proposed a British run network schools of train uh, to train Indian craftsmen and promote their economically threatened industries. The emphasis was to apply Western modes of production with model examples of traditional Indian forms. Kipling was a pioneer of this colonial pedagogy. He was the director curator of the uh, curator of the Central Museum at Lahore from 1875 to 19, 1893. The museum could boast a large and varied textile section and an industrial art department which displayed actual specimens, models and photographs of artisans showing the status of manufacture material and designs of the arts and crafts of the Punjab. For our project Black Spring 2016, only formally speaking, clusters of the Texali area in Lahore were outlined by orange light on the rooftops which created a web of lives, lights when seen from the sky. For those who were slayed in the dark alleys, 2015, a simple triangular paper bunting was printed in repetition carrying imprint headlines of those who were lost in the name of what they believed in or were caught in unaware like the teachers and child martyrs of the Peshawar school attack. A circular labyrinth walkway carried the buntings. This sensibility and somewhat collateral aesthetic emerges from the locale, the community and the public itself. For a smaller project in 2015, when we took handprints of public school children on cardboard, cardboard takhtis, traditional slates, with a non-objection certificate to ribbon hang them around the barbed wire of the Charing Cross Lahore, the ribbons, messages from young ones, to the martyrs and handprints saw only a few hours of glory and were removed from the site when we revisited the same evening to see them. Awami Art Collective's practice is grounded in local experience and memory. John Dewey's focus on experience as art and knowledge has a certain renaissance, resonance with our process. Dewey positions societal obligations and culture, knowledge and learning as the creative act. Anthropologist Ellen Desenke viewed things and activities themselves as works of art. For Dewey, unlike Plato, art was not an imitation of nature and education was a force for social reconstruction. While working on the Taksali rooftops with hammers, buyers and the community, weather hazards with a paper installation or sitting and gazing into dismantled shrines or white paper buntings, which carried lives and names on lush green grass, Dewey's texts of experience and ordinary life experiences as center for growth and ideas become real in the give and take of this process, where there is no finality and necessary human activity can be visual art. In colonial India, Ravi Verma's 1948 to 1906 academic realism spread across the Bombay JJ School of Art and Calcutta School of Art, along with the nationalist sentiment of the Bengal school manner in the early 20th century with uh, E.B. Hevel, A.K. Kumar Swami, and A.N. Tagore as propagators. This opposition took over the first four decades of the 20th century. 
Bengal school made its way into Punjab through Samidhanath Gupta 1887-1964 to as a student of Abindranath Tagore. Contradictions and conflict have been the key instigators of art and aesthetic in the subcontinent. As tastes, choices and perceptions are borrowed, returned, unlearned and shared, the art, geography and politics of this region may remain and thrive as an oxymoron. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you so much. That was a great paper. And I love how you guys were giving the paper while um, you, you were in the public, you were talking about the public and you were out in the public or at the street in the garden, uh, which I thought gave a lot of resonance uh, to your work itself. I'm gonna introduce our last paper. And again, um, before I do so, I would like to ask people to, you can type in questions into the Q&A box. We already have some coming in. It'd be great to have some more too. Um, so our last paper today, uh, <clears throat> sorry, our last paper today is Thinking Through Empire from Asia, an object lesson. And our speaker, Stephanie Bailey. Stephanie Bailey is editor in chief of Ocular Magazines, um, and Art Papers Contributing Editor and Managing Editor of Podium, which is the online journal of M Plus in Hong Kong. She's also on the advisory board member of Divan, a journal of accounts and part of the Naked Punch editorial collective. She also writes for Art Forum, Art Monthly, Canvas, and Yushu Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, and has curated the Art Basel Hong Kong Conversations program since 2015. Bailey's research centers on power relations coded into the production and exchange of cultures. Essays have appeared in Navigating the Planetary in 2020, Future Imperfect Contemporary Art Practices and Cultural Institutions in the Middle East in 2016. The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, part of the 20th Biennale of Sydney catalog in 2016. Amenity, the catalogue of the Armenian Pavilion at the 56th Venice Biennale in 2015, and Hypocrite um, in Fresh Hell in 2015. Um, she has also done numerous uh, editorial projects, including Children of Empire for Leap in um, issue number 37, which is in February 2016, with contributions, uh, among others, uh, Uzma Rezvi. Geopolitics on the Edge is yet another work, a dossier for art papers, uh, which was published in 2016, and Non-Aligned Movement, Leap 45, which was published in June 2017. Uh, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Stephanie Bailey. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. Thank you, everyone. Um, and hi to everyone who's here. Um, thank you, Hamad Ming and Sarah for including me in this gathering of speakers. And honestly, as a, as a Sunday academic, it's thrilling and humbling. Um, so uh, for today, I'm, I've am i mashed up the two titles of two different sessions, Thinking Through Empire, Imperial Histories, Object Lessons, and Thinking From Asia, um, in order to draw a circle from and back, but now after listening to Patrick, I'm thinking around and through um, to Art Basel in Hong Kong as the object in question. An annual art fair staged on the edge of Victoria Harbour. Um, and this is a very rainy view of Hong Kong with my back <laughs> to Victoria Harbour. Um, a body of water shaped and in turn shaped by a colonial port city where lives, monies and histories intersect. So, um, I've been working on conversations, as mentioned, since 2015, um, and I see it as a discursive space, knowingly situated as the Asia edition of Art Basel, a fair like Art Basel in a city like Hong Kong, um, an ex-British colony developed into a neoliberal free port in the late 20th century and now assimilating to the PRC. Um, and of course, we mustn't forget that Asia itself, as with so many geopolitical names like it, uh, as with its geographies, histories and peoples, not uh, is as elastic as it is uh, cross-hatching, a little bit like Art Basel itself, uh, which represents to some the apex of the global art world entitled capitals, uh, neoliberal, you might say, capitalist, homogenizing, scare quotes if you like, 
definitely something to anyone who thinks about art fairs, um, or which is to say, a fair like Art Basel is definitely something to anyone who steps inside. So I'm just gonna map very briefly the program and you'll see there's just a scrolling um, slideshow of images of the talks. Some of them I'm mentioning and it has all the speaker information. Um, so on average between 2015 and 2019, I'd say we ran about 20 conversations a year, uh, an opportunity for audiences and speakers and practitioners from across the region and beyond to explore commonalities and divergences in practice, um, historical trajectories, curatorial formats, approaches, institutional conditions, and so on. Uh, in a way, the fact that the talk space was kind of a catchment area uh, where we gathered people together to speak a while, uh, whether they were in Hong Kong for the fair itself or whether we had um, asked for them to join us. Um, the program is free and all videos go online. Um, here you'll see one from 2021 when of course everyone was doing the Zoom talks as we are now. Um, and because we have a broad mix of audiences, including those in the future who we might, we hope will use these recordings as documents, snapshots in time. Um, but because of this, the, the program is tailored across frequencies, uh, whether based on region, discipline, trends, debates, and case studies, and so on. But there are some running themes, and here's one of them. Hong Kong, of course, is one. Um, this was a uh, rebel city, Hong Kong as a science situation, which we staged in 2015 to think about the aftermath of the umbrella movement from the perspective of artist practitioners in Hong Kong. Um, this was followed with a city focused uh, panel, Does Political Art Matter in 2017, which was then uh, followed up in 2018 with the panel, one of my personal favorites, Communism as Communism. Um, followed by what was to be in 2020, Bearing Witness, Hong Kong as Site and Situation, Part 2, which of course uh, couldn't happen because the fair was cancelled because of COVID. Um, we also hold regional panels. So just to give you a little broad view um, of the sort of thematics that run through the programme, we hold regional panels. So in 2015, for instance, when uh, we did India and Pakistan at the Venice Biennial, uh, we've done a panel called China Africa, organized by Xin Wang, based on an exhibition she curated at the IFA NYU in 2018, um, with Samuel Foso, He Xiang Yu, Hu Xiang Tian, and Edson Chagas. And joining us, on, us in Hong Kong was He Xiang Yu, and uh, oh, my apologies, it was Hu Xiang Tian, I believe. Uh, no, sorry, it was He, he Xiang Yu, sorry. Um, it was Samuel Foso, He Xiang Yu, and they were joined by Oluremi uh, Onobanjo, who's the Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Walter Collection. Okay, so we have regions, uh, but of course we also look at geography as a concept in and of itself. Um, of course we have done panels on uh, curating Asia, square quotes, but we've also looked at um, the concept of geographies of the imagination itself, which was actually the title of an exhibition staged at Savvy Contemporary, uh, which we then turned into a roundtable discussion moderated by Christina Lee with uh, Rafael Chikukwa, Antonio Alampi, Natasha Jinwala, and Niyo. So we also, as always, we go through the art histories as well. And you know, this being a fair in Hong Kong, and I think that we've seen this with other fairs let's say, for example, Art Dubai, um, that these spaces, once they're outside of the sort of Western center, let's say, they also offer opportunities to write histories. Obviously, um, history making it at this point in affair is almost like an archaeology for the future, because you have to go back in order to catch up for what was erased or lost. And I think that this is quite common in, in colonial conditions. Um, so. We also, for example, we did one panel on ink and paint, Asian modernisms, which was moderated by M plus ink curator Leslie Ma to explore the histories of modernism in Asia um, across the market, academic and uh, private public perspectives. So always practice is a core interest um, across specialisms, whether working models, uh, which was a panel with gallerists Hormoz Hamatian, Young Chun, and Vanessa Carlos, uh, founder of Condo, where galleries in Twin Cities partner to show works in each other's spaces. And this was moderated by Silver Lenses Issa Lorenz, Lorenzo. 
Um, and also body work, performance and practice, uh, which was beautifully moderated by the artist Wu Tang with Victoria Sin, Juliana Huxtable, Melati Suryodharma and Sonia Karana. Um, and this is a very meta talk of curators of conversation programs um, coming together in a conversations program, the image that just passed. So with all of these talks, simultaneous translation is crucial. Um, and actually the discussion that Yiwan uh, was kind enough to moderate with, uh, for us along with John Tain um, on feminist aesthetics, uh, which had speakers Frida Kahlo and Kathy Kolwitz from The Gorilla Girls, Yuri Nagashima, Nilima Sheikh, and Yu Hong. Um, that conversation actually ran in Japanese, uh, Chinese and English. And you know, to listen to it at that time was really something else. So you, the translators were incredible. Okay, so that talk um, on feminist aesthetics, this took place amid Me Too and is part of a stream that picks up on debates taking place within contemporary art and further afield um, and tries to expand them in a cross-regional, cross-generational and or cross-disciplinary way while also keeping an eye on those themes to try and keep that conversation going somehow. But of course, it's really important to state here that so many factors feed into the program itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm but walking us through one strand. Then there's the elephant in the room, of course, which is art for art. You don't want to ignore the context. So we have obviously organized conversations um, thinking about art for art. There was that famous, uh, it, it's, a, it's a term that was coined. Um, and basically what we did was we asked artists to sort of reflect on what does it mean for them. And I think in 2017, we had uh, Ryan Gander and Pio Abad who were showing in Encounters that year. So we also had Alexis de Glass Cantor, who's the curators of Encounters. Um, with uh, UCCA's Phil Tanari, and this was followed up in 2019 um, with a talk titled A Commonplace Artists in Art Fairs, led by uh, Asia Art Archives, Osge Ursoy, with artists Haixian Huang, Elm Green and Dragset, Ivan Navarro, and the author of The Art Fair Age, Paco Barragan. All right. So the subtext running through the program in one way or another is decolonization or forms thereof. Decolonizing ethnography in 2018 being one example. Um, considering terms as decolonized and ethnography in the context of artistic practices that challenge the tendency towards categorization, artists Shawe Tai, Gala Porus Kim, Lisa Rehana and Yi Ilan described strategies to co-opt languages, systems, and forms as part of the struggle to participate in the production of representation and its meaning. And actually trained as an anthropologist, Porus Kim's concern was about, quote, writing history, not from a top-down view, such as male or global north, but from, a, but from an individual domestic perspective, a democratic way of looking at our shared history, unquote, that acknowledges the representation and I'm quoting Gala again, of history is almost impossible to achieve. So the impossibility of achieving a neat singular history, given the multitude of views constituting historical experience, not to mention those which are erased, to think about history as shared and multiple contentious, as a commons, if there ever was one, of debate, transaction, negotiation, stakes, interests, and amid all that, relation and growth, both entropic and perhaps exponential, so some still hope. Um, it, it is perhaps one way of thinking about Art Basel Hong Kong, which is to say um, a commons. It, it's a commons. And so this is where we move from Asia to London to find a common ancestor of the modern and contemporary art fair of which Art Basel is the second of its kind after launching in 1970 following Kunstmarkt Köln in 1967, the year the term World's Fair was replaced by Expo apparently. So the 1851 Great Exhibition of Works and Industry in London, and I really apologize to those who've heard this uh, history before as, as I've mapped it out, was a showcase of British imperial and industrial power and is considered the first world's fair. Marx and Engels called it proof of the concentrated power with which modern large scale industry is everywhere demolishing national barriers and increasingly blurring local peculiarities of production, society and national character among all peoples. It was a time of accelerated transition when as organizer Prince Albert described modern invention as rapidly closing distances once separating the globe. 
And at this the time, the first long distance trains and steamships crossing the Atlantic uh, in two weeks brought around six million people to London over six months. Prince Albert also saw the event, which uh, showcased spoils, innovations, discoveries, artworks, and inventions as a gesture towards the fulfillment, and I'm quoting him now, that great end where all history points, the realization of the unity of mankind, which is a one world view that not only recalls China's one world, one dream slogan for the 2008 Olympic games, not to mention the one belt, one road initiative, which revives ancient trade routes to establish new global paradigms in trade and diplomacy, but also Pamela M. Lee describing art fairs and biennials as both object and agent of a market system inextricably linked to the processes of globalization. So the so-called unity of the Great Exhibition positioned the British Empire at the center of, the global of a global economy of its making, inscribed with the necroeconomics of industrialized extractive colonization, thereby forging, per Dan Smith, Western modernity's formation of display, spectacle, surveillance, and commodity. The Crystal Palace, as you can see on the slide here, was divided into sectors. The Western half devoted to Britain and its empire, India, Africa, the Caribbean, uh, Canada, and the Eastern half accommodating displays of other nations, such as China, uh, France, and the United States. As Paul Young has extensively detailed, Aboriginal product products were stripped of any cultural resonance and offered up as raw material, any cultural significance omitted. The China exhibit, meanwhile, which apparently had no little to no participation from the Chinese state, was described in one review as exhibiting the qualities exemplified by the early stages of civilization. So as Young summarizes, what occurred here was a pronounced exhibitionary drive to strip non-European communities of cultural and historical significance that they might be, so that they might be easily and profitably assimilated into a global economy. Um, yeah, so there being other, so this is an image of New York State Pavilion. Um, so the World's Fair phenomenon has continued. I think it's happening in Dubai this year, actually. Um, so there being other empires in the ring at the time, and this was the 19th century moving into the, the turn of the 20th, um, the World's Fair became a seriously popular phenomenon in the United States and Europe with events notoriously shipping in indigenous people as exhibits. So it, in a way, it's no surprise then that the Venice Bien Biennial organizers, we all know by the national pavilion format as much as, as and as much by national funding sources, emerged out of the World Fair trend in 1895. It was actually a nationals fair. And then it was eventually developed into an international exhibition. The pavilion timeline in Venice starts with Belgium, the oldest building completed in 1907 during the reign of the butcher Leopold II, followed by Hungary, Great Britain and Germany in 1909. The latter pavilion rebuilt in 1938 according to a Nazi approved design, the year of Kristallnacht. The outbreak of World War II in September 1939, the year the World's Fair in New York saw the building of what would become the Queen's Museum, where the UN General Assembly actually made decisions like the partitioning of Palestine for a time just after World War II. Um, was, but, so World War II was not enough though to stop the 90, uh, 1940 Venice Biennial from happening, albeit without Austria, Britain, Denmark, France, the Soviet Union and Poland, where the Warsaw Ghetto would be established in October that year. With Mussolini already in power, he showed Hitler around the 1934 edition of the Biennial. The US pres presence in 1940 is described by critic Lawrence Alloway as, quote, a reminder of the general acceptability of fascism at the time. That the show happened while half of Europe was fighting for survival, he continues, is as impressive as it is bizarre. Such are the contradictory measures of indifference, action, adulation that the Venice Biennial, no less the art world, some might say, can elicit from its participants as a cultured stage where not only explicit and indirect politics play out, such as the 1974 edition, which was staged in solidarity uh, with Chile following Pinochet's uh, violent coup overthrowing Allende in 1973, but where ambiguities and fissures arise because among other things, uh, there are imbalances that the national pavilion format um, can reveal, which in turn is a reflection of international politics as well. So one, one example is Greece, whose debut in 1932 uh, happened after much debate between 
a state seemingly unwilling to bear the cost of participation and those who were stressing the national prestige that it would bring. Um, and eventually the debut was deferred to 1934 because of the country defaulting on its foreign debt. Um, so it's a case of, yeah, history feeding into the present. These histories and asymmetries, they feed into the moments that we are in when we're in spaces like this. Just as the 1851 Great Exhibition proclaimed an idealistic message of global unity through racialized capitalism, so the art fair and biennial tell a different story beyond the public messaging around a global community. Um, and as an example, in 2017, Artsy's race and, race and ethnicity breakdown at the 57th Venice Biennial counted 57% uh, white at the top and 1% First Nations at the bottom when it came to um, participating artists which recalls uh, Wu Qintao's description of the global art world's basic structure as concentric and hierarchical. So I'm just gonna round up here, guys. I'm sorry, I've run on. All of which connects to the historical framework from which the art fair format and biennial descend, uh, through which forms and processes of world making, whether ideological, relational or transactional, are reflected and enacted. In this analysis, you could read the global art world or its industrial complex as a space of biopolitics rooted in the history of Western imperialist modernity. And the art fair and biennial, its nodes, uh, they nodes that form a fragmented commons for a transient network that replicates and expands itself, which is why I tend to speak about biennials and art fairs as a pair so often. These are both world-making formats that facilitate the gathering of communities a gathering of a community of communities, drawing people out and in whenever it stages itself across the map, merging, melding, establishing, circulating, speculating on ideas, cultures, histories, as much as markets, all moved by people and objects that circulate world space, transforming places, sometimes imperceptibly in the process. And these are engines of capitalist modernity, which makes them sites well, as these are engines of a capitalist modernity, they are sites of an ongoing struggle and a historic one. The arduous work of disentangling inter intergenerational trauma brought across systems and minds around the world by imperialist and colonial colonialist violence. And I believe there are many words to describe that process. Um, this is where things have become interesting in recent decades, however. In the wide frame, art, fair, art fairs and biennials mark out, of course, a global exhibitionary complex that is intrinsically contradictory if you take into account the historical trajectory that these formats uh, are connected to. But what makes it interesting now is how both formats are being used in post-colonial or perhaps rather decolonizing or neo-colonizing uh, neo contexts. As they are being used to engage in world making in a world where everywhere seems to be on the make. And here the Sharjah Biennial and Art Dubai are two really great examples tied as they are to state cultural policy with echoes of the approach that Singapore takes to culture as nation building device. But we can talk about this in the Q&A if you'd like a bit more information. Um, all right, so as a Frankenstein form, there's many ways that we can look at them. We could look at them as apparatus of security, structures that act like plugs in which users can connect into, connect into a system, a grid in which a particular commodity, uh, here art, is circulated, supplied, demanded, and valued. We could see them as free zones, uh, what Keller Easterling describes as a highly contagious and globalized urban form in a vivid vessel. Um, in which multiple forces, state, non-state, military, market, and non-market, have now attained the considerable pa power and administrative authority to necessary, necessarily undertake the building of infrastructure. Or we could even apply uh, East, Easterling's earlier conception of the spatial product, a hybrid site defined using cruise ships, ports, resorts as examples, familiar commercial formulas of retail business and trade that aspired, and I'm quoting Easterling, aspire to be world, worlds unto themselves, self-reflexive and innocent of politics, but in fact can become political pawns and objects of contention imbued with the myths and desires of capital. So how this relates back to thinking about, uh, thinking through empire from Asia using Art Basel Hong Kong as an object lesson is in the phenomenology of the structure whose form originates in a Western model dripping in the hallmarks of imperialist sorting and spectacle, but is now located in an ex-colony being assimilated into what some have described as a neo-imperial world power. Contradictory, of course, complicit, absolutely, 
but a populated and organic space too. Social, cultural, and political in its potential is a place where a motley mix of people in no way shape unified as one, form a microcosm of mainstream globalization for a minute, creating conditions that recall Stuart Hall's description of a dissolving politics of the center that, quote, reveals the contradictions and social antagonisms gathering beneath. In a city where the free market is posited as a liberatory, liberatory force against communist China, China by some corners, Paul Werner's assertion that, quote, the very admiring of art becomes an adherence to a free market ideology is as much a can of worms as unfurling a colonial flag as a sign of protest. In Hong Kong, to think of something like the art fair as a frame and format, London made almost, is to consider like, it is to consider the fair almost like a circus tent on a rainy day with many groups sharing the tent for cover. An image that brings to mind Ernesto Lacklau's definition of an empty signifier, though in this case, we're talking about a structure, a format, whose quote, emptiness unifies diverse groups, a unity made possible in the, and I'm quoting Lacla here, in the establishment of a frontier of exclusion that institutes an antagonism with a repressive power. But even this Lacklau note signifies hegemony, a link back to the world from which a, an event like Art Basel was made. So at this point, I'm gonna stop. Um, I'm sorry that I went on a little bit and this was just a very broad sketch, but um, I'm hopefully we can expand on things in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was definitely a broad escape, um, uh, mapping of the, uh, the welfare and thinking about art, our uh, Basel as an object is a really interesting way of repositioning it as an active place. Um, I would like to invite all the speakers to share their cameras and perhaps show their faces while we start our Q&A. Um, we already have some questions in place. Um, uh, but before I start that, a huge round of applause for all of our speakers today and thinking about the interconnections between your papers and, and also uh, we'll ask the speakers if they would like to also can think of their own connections with some of the other papers as well. So let me start because uh, we only have about 20 minutes in time, so I'm just going to um, go straight to one of the questions which was submitted, which uh, is addressed to um, Amrita, and this is from Sahib, and she, he wants to thank you for geological. Sorry, yeah. You're back now, never mind. Uh, you just pause for a moment if you wouldn't mind repeating the question. Oh, I'm sorry. This is my patchy um, connection. Let me say this again. In discussing futurality, I'm keen to know how you reconcile geological propositions with technological propulsions that include the production of big data visualization you shared, particularly because the latter more often than not seems to be a big factor in geological disruptions and global warming. I'm smiling because I think that was a huge question. Um, it feels like an impossible question and I'm not sure if you're gonna like my answer, but I'm gonna give it a go. So I think firstly, um, to be direct, I don't think I'm trying to reconcile the two. Um, and I think that, you know, what I was also talking about was the very, the idea that there's many multiple antagonistic forces at play here and that that um, opposition is just one of them, that um, relation is just one of them. And I also think the closer and more, I guess, intimate I become with this manifesto and this text and this way of seeing the world, I guess the more comfortable I become with these oppositional forces and not trying to reconcile them. Although the one that you pose is a huge one because it's so detrimental to basically life as it is. So I understand that. But I think, um, I think for the artist, though, what seems to be super urgent right now is actually trying to record the stories of those geological forces before it's too late. So she talks and refers to the ice as this archive in loss. 
So actually getting to those places and boarding those movements and also getting to those places quick enough so that we can start to learn to think like those places. Why I brought in Guisson as well, because he was very much invested in that as a way to actually build and mend and heal for the future. Um, in terms of the visualization I shared as well, I think it's important to clarify what that was. So it was a GIF, it was an artwork. And what comprises the, that visualiza visualization is actually um, fragmented and cut up um, pictures of the sand, the grains of sand and the sandstorm itself. So what like I'm showing there as well is perhaps rather than reconciling, we can sort of set a balance between the two forces. And perhaps we can actually imbue technology with, with these forms of knowledges, whether that's the sandstorm or whether that's the cosmologies that we are thinking and drawing from, but also ones that we are creating of our own. So I think in a nutshell, it's impossible well, from my perspective, it is, but I think perhaps we can maintain a balance. And it also made me think about, um, and I brought in David Madala very briefly, but when he made his sand machines, um, there was an optimism to them, even though one of them was called Lament. Um, and I think that was after witnessing a sandstorm, but someone can, can correct me there. But I think there was also this like fascination and hope that you can um actually use technology as an ally for the future and the health and the well-being of the planet so he was thinking about using solar panel as a way to irrigate the deserts for example so perhaps it's about maintaining that kind of relationship between the two that's my best response to that. That's a good one. I mean, and it kind of feeds into your idea of radical survival, which was such a tantalizing idea that you kind of put out there. And I was just wondering if you want to speak a little bit to that. And also as a response to a question from Helen Starr, who wants to ask you to ask a bit more on Himali's concepts of acceleration of violence as well. Mm. So I think with that line in the manifesto, um, it was aligned to denouncing futurism mm. and my interpretation of that line and it may be completely not true but I thought that was a reference to the first futurism which was the Italian futurism mm. and therefore when you think about it <laughs> their ideology was fascist so you know again it's this like that maintaining that balance rather than technology dominating over everything, which is that that's what they were invested in. They were invested in war. They were invested in these churches of speed and violence and complete obliteration of, of people, actually. And I think I see this denouncing of futurism in that respect as a warning to us to not get too carried away and to maybe pace our relationship with technology. And I do think that the artists that are very, you know, quickly dropped at the end are thinking about that. And again, relating to this idea of how can we imbue technology and our relationship to it by drawing from the natural cycles and rhythms of um, the earth before we even came onto this place. So I think we have to kind of go back in order to move forward and just understand the cycles of things. Mm. Um, but that's how I see what she was trying to allude to there. Um, I want to sort of switch gears a little just to also bring in some of our other speakers, but following in some ways in what you were talking about um, in, in thinking about the different kinds of ways that the public is, uh, or the spaces in which this antagonism can, can take place. I want to turn to Frida's, um, Faradi's uh, paper and, sorry, have I got a CS paper? And they were talking about this, the destruction of the, the statue, the st destruction of the sculpture itself. And, but how the conversation then moved into the internet. In some ways it became, it kind of became resurrected and we 
position in a different kind of public, even though it was finally destroyed from the garden, it moved to a different kind of place. One which is actually devoid or taken, taken apart from locality. And I was wondering if you can talk about a bit about that the internet is a different kind of public and what does that mean for public art? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you see, uh, the, the sculpture was not uh, displaced. I think it was destroyed because in the pretext that it was displaced, uh, there was no way that they could take it away and place it somewhere else. Also, there were suggestions by some of the people who were really keen to have the sculpture, but maybe just to move it somewhere else as if this place was very sacred and this was a disgrace to that place. So, so they suggested to, uh, to move it somewhere else and replace this, this park with some a more uh, perfect kind of sculpture of uh, the poet, national poet. Uh, so it, right, first thing is that it was destroyed, you know, in dismantling. Mm. Uh, this, this idea that, you know, for six months, the local public, which was visiting that park, was enjoying it. The whole motive of uh, creating that by people who were working in the, in the park was to create a selfie point. So it was successful in that sense that people enjoyed it. Uh, and you can find videos of, you know, people uh, having a, um, a, boat a boat trip in the lake, uh, man-made lake nearby, and they are viewing it from the lake and they're enjoying it, that they are feeling proud of it. And the social media, uh, which is like someone posted a selfie in front of that, and it was taken notice by uh, leading uh, news channel person who was very powerful and I don't know why uh, he thought it was important primarily because it was a political um, there was a political motive behind because that channel uh, is uh, currently dealing with opposition ideas uh, with um, and they are in opposition to the government sitting government so in order to point score uh, so they thought this is that this is a very valid way of you know accusing them of some kind of nepotism or some kind of false uh, a bad commissioning so he sort of you know per, did a person attack in his tweet that uh, do you recognize who is this and he was his grandfather uh, the per, who the senator in the uh, current government so i think that triggered a lot of things that you know although he never replied the grandson never replied on social media but so many people on social media who I don't think ever visited because all, all of them were trying to figure out what is the story uh, of who is a maker. And till today, you don't find the names of the makers on internet. It's just like they are constantly referred as gardeners. So um, social media becomes like a very powerful tool, but I would say that to just simplify it to the extent that it's a pressure of social media that the government was uh, pressurized. Uh, I think it's much more complex because it is usually, um, there are so many times there is a lot of pressure, like, you know, currently the prime minister is being uh, condemned all over Pakistan and uh, in the world about his statement against women. Uh, and the abuse and the rape, you know, that kind of uh, statement. I don't know if you have heard about it. And people are constantly, you know, they, are, they have issued statements like Human Rights Commission and women um, bodies are on the streets and they are protesting, uh, but they are adamant and they don't feel the pressure. So I think it is something more than just simple social media pressure. And Sahar, if you want to add something. Yeah, no, I think you have mentioned everything. Uh, exactly what you have said, just to sort of uh, continue on that. I feel that, yeah, social media was a mere tool at the end of the day. And it can be made as powerful or as, as weak uh, as we want it to be. So, yeah, that's what I believe in, that social media, it has a huge sort of um, it has a trickle down effect uh, and it can reach anybody but again in Pakistan it also has to do with the uh, people who operate on social media because it's a different class altogether people who have uh, 
Instagram accounts, people have, who have Twitter accounts, they are educated people and they belong to a certain class. And I think it has to do with that as well. Thank you for the answer. I'm just stepping in as chair because I think Yiwon's um, connection has gone down. So um, I'll just um, take over um, chair and duties for the moment and just turn to the Q&A box and the chat box where there are a few points around um, a similar theme. And, and these questions are for you, Stephanie, about your use of the term commons or the idea um, about the commons. Um, Annie Kwan in the, the chat has asked you to um, expand further on the nature of the commons that you use. And um, we've also got um, a comment um, from an anonymous attendee saying, could you um, say more about your characterization of Art Basel HK, HK as commons and um, who is allowed in this commons? So I think it builds on this point about who has access to these spaces. And then from uh, Sabi um, Ahmed, who um, says to you, thank you. The Art Basel conversations has indeed been the highlight of every edition of um, Art Basel Hong Kong for several years, but isn't a, a, an equating of globalization with the commons riddled with multiple problems, um, one of them being that the vast asymmetry of power, resource and movement that globalization brings with it, opposed to a very different aspiration that the commons invite. So could you tell us more about how you're uh, mobilizing this um, idea of the commons, some really thoughtful and provocative responses there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really good question, and I think it kind of taps into some of the things that I touch on, but lightly in the text, which is also about words, right? And I think that you know, a word is a commons. If you were to think about the basic um, description of what a commons is, you know, sort of the medieval world, it's a shared common resource that is that is sort of governed by central power because, you know, Thomas Hobbes, I don't know, decided that people could entrust themselves to live. Uh, without self-interest, let's say, right? It's the Garrett Hardin's uh, tragedy of the commons that because man can't act without self-interest, then uh, a central power, a sovereign power needs to kind of, you know, create the social contract in which we can all live together. But ultimately there is a, a pyramid uh, shape there, right? Um, whereas actually I think that, you know, when Eleanor Ostrom did her work, and of course I, I read all this stuff when it was, you know, the, um, you know, the Indignados movement in Spain, the known unknowns in Greece, the, the so-called Arab Spring was happening, um, squares were being occupied all over the world. There was a big discussion about the commons. There was a conception that the commons is something that is free for everyone or it is open to everyone, when actually it's a very managed space in the sense that even if it's a horizontally shared uh, commons, a commonly managed resource pool, as Eleanor Ostrom put it in her example of the Alanya fisheries in Turkey, it's a horizontal mode of, uh, it's, a, it's a horizontal contract, let's put it that way, rather than a, a pyramidal one, which is sort of the, the kind of, whenever I think about the art fair as an object, I think about pyramid, um, sort of like in Philip K. Dick's Maze of Death, which is, you know, everyone sees the Maze of Death, but it looks different to everyone, so they don't think they're talking about the same thing. And, you know, this question about the commons reminds me very much about, um, I was asked to write an essay about the definition of the planetary. And, you know, I think one of the things I love about being a practitioner in the art world, because I should always say that I'm, I'm an art writer first and foremost, and everything I've learned is through art. And that's been a very interesting experience when I go into academic spaces and I'm realizing how much, like for example, in the School of Law, where you realize how much art can actually work in a different context as a visual tool, but visual is just one of the many factors in, in the way it can function. So anyway, um, you know, I was asked to define the planetary and what was really interesting to me when starting to read through the literature of it, globalization. Of course, I think when we're talking about globalization, I can hear it. It's that sort of conception of the globalization as this insidious, pro insidious process that sort of runs in parallel with Thatcher and Reagan that sort of tries to enca encapsulate the world into a, tech uh, in sort of, into a sort of technosphere, right? Sort of like an enclosure politics, right? Which is sort of what destroyed the commons actually in, in Britain, if I remember correctly. And again, I'm not a historian, I learned this from Rachel Rose um, with her works on that subject. Um, so to the point about art, the art fair as a commons, you know, I, I think that the world is a commons. I think the earth is a commons. It's a natural resource. We all depend on it. We all share it. And so actually to the point earlier when, you know, we all think about it when we hear we, what do we mean? I don't mind saying we if I, if I think I'm relating, to, I'm referring to everything that lives and dies on this planet, <laughs> then it's a we. 
in a way, I guess. There's always a debate to be had. Um, so to the point on Art Basel, a commons is not a free, open public space. That's not how I interpret it. Um, you would go into situations in London during the Occupy where they would be claiming that this was free space, but actually you would find out that this was private land now and they had the right to kick you off. It was a, a mercy that they would let you occupy. Um, and the thing is in Hong Kong, if you think about the shopping mall culture that we have there, this sort of very strange blend between public and private is something that I think is quite common. And, and you know, you know, uh, David Harvey's talked about it. The cities is a commons. A commons is a resource that we share and we have to figure out how we're going to share that in common. For me, that's how it's, it's a way that I can think about the art fair, but really I'm not talking about the art fair as a commons and as per se, I'm talking about art because, you know, if you think about the global art world and just how massive this network is, this grand tour of these very fine events and these biennials and art fairs, et cetera. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all bound by this word called art, which you could claim as a commons, right? Because everyone has a claim to it in a certain way. People have stakes, people have interests, and yet we have to all negotiate what it means to us in a certain way, which I think is what makes a fair like Art Basel in Hong Kong right now, especially interesting because you know, we're all dealing with these questions of globalization, you know, COVID, we're so connected, but so divided. And it's just been these conversations that have been going on, you know, for the last, well, let's say since Trump, let's put it that way. Um, you know, the question is, it, it's the question that's asked time after time, how are we going to figure out how to live together? Um, to, make, to start with an art fair, perhaps, is like this sort of model of the commons of a microcosm for a world to figure out how to live together. Maybe that's actually more accurate then an idea that we're all going into a field and we're going to like start a commune and you know everything will go back to the way that it was in some prelapsarian time. Stephanie, I feel like this is, um, I can imagine if this uh, conversation was happening um, at a conference that was taking place in a physical location, this would be the kind of thing that we'd be all, you know, going debating into the, the wee hours of the morning with you. And uh, I, can, I can feel, you know, lots of conversation bubbling. It's almost like we need a, a separate uh, seminar, but I'm going to hand back to Yiwan, who I can see on screen. Um, and uh, I, Yiwan, I was just sort of temporarily occupying the chair Thank you. Seat, uh, whilst whilst uh, your internet was down, but we had a really um, productive conversation there, um, and, and lots more ideas raised um, in response to Stephanie's paper. But back over to you, Yuan. Thank you, thank you. Um, sorry for dropping off. Unfortunately, internet took the better of me. Unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time. I know um, Rita has a hand up, but I'm afraid I'm just gonna. I have to move on and maybe we can carry on this conversation later on as well, because I want to pass um, the last question to Patrick, um, because I think this could be a good way of how to wrap up the, uh, the session as it is. And this is actually a, uh, this is actually a question from one of our audience members. And this is the question. Can you talk about how you chose to move across multiple disciplines in your sites of analysis? It's a big question. Uh, at the end of the paper, I, I, I talked about curatorial thinking. So I think this has enabled me as an art historian to move uh, quite nimbly, maybe, uh, between registers and between disciplines. Uh, it's also part of my training as a humanities student. Um, uh, the art history that I learned in, in Manila was through humanities, not the art history that we know uh, in, in the West. So it was, it had broader sympathies as, as a discipline and it allowed me to, um, to look at different materials from different perspectives. I always thought of it as somewhere between activism and anthropology. The, the, the production of art <laughs> was somewhere between uh, those two spheres. So I think it's uh, a curatorial constellative thinking uh, that uh, has allowed me to do that. Yeah. Thank you, I think that's a great answer. And one I think that really also encapsulate the, the speakers and our papers this afternoon who also came from very different places and who also kind of captured these different registers of ideas of where art is made, but what, what 
where do we see them? Where do we act on them as well? I think that's been one of the most really interesting, fruitful discussions that has come out. And we're going to take a break um, for, I think, unless I am um, corrected, for about 10 minutes. And then we will return at 3.30 when we will have a uh, wrap up the session and we'll be joined by uh, the conveners and with John Tain as well. So see you guys all back in about 10 minutes.
Well, I really mean this was legitimate questions you're asking me. Asking me, well, you know, guess what? Employers can't find workers. I said, yeah. Okay, so I think we will make a start on our final wrap up session. I think we've got um, most people back and we've also got a good number of the audience still with us. We know that uh, uh, London Asia Art World's uh, panels are like long distance events. <laughs> And uh, the stamina is uh, quite incredible of everyone involved. So thank you for staying with us uh, for the conversation. And we're going to share this uh, last um, part of the panel with um, John Tain. So John, welcome. Um, who is going to uh, join with uh, Ming, um, Hamad and myself and uh, we can draw in other members of the panel as well, other members of the audience um, into this conversation to really um, begin to, um, I don't think we can wrap up um, five weeks of, uh, of a program, but we can explore some of the broader themes um, and ideas and um, provocations that have been um, presented. So, so John, I'm going to hand over to you now um, and perhaps we can um, bring, our, uh, bring you into the conversation and, and open up some of those ideas. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's a daunting task because I think uh, over the past five weeks, there's been so much that we've heard. So first off, I want to congratulate you, Hamad and Ming, uh, on convening such a rich and wonderful uh, gathering uh, over this period, and also to Shauna and uh, Danny for for so ably managing this and organizing it all. So I think that, you know, one place that maybe we can start is by thinking about, you know, um, the, the ground that's been covered, I think both in terms of geography, which is appropriate given that, you know, uh, this has been a conference that centered around questions of uh, London, Asia, art worlds, right? And, um, but also I think there's been a lot of ground covered in terms of subject matter and chronology. I mean, tonight alone, for instance, we've had uh, a conversation that's moved through Benny Goodman and jazz, Rabindranath uh, Tagore, futurity, Art Basel and the art fair as object, social media, language, athletic spectacle, the commons and public sculpture, and uh, last but not least, ice as archive. Um, now that we're at, really at the conclusion of the program, uh, I was wondering if we could look back uh, at the start and talk a bit about the first two terms in the conference's title, uh, that is London and Asia, and the relationships between them. Um, I think historically the connections between those two terms has been one that's primarily been defined through colonialism and Orientalism, uh, hence the strong present representation uh, by South Asia, for instance, in, during this conference. Of course, uh, uh, colonialism has also run through several of the panels as a historical topic, and especially yesterday's session on thinking through empire, and uh, last week's session on bureaucracy and agency. 
But these have been leavened by other panels uh, on sociality and affect, potential histories and solidarity, uh, circulation and counter that suggest other possibilities and other ways of thinking for thinking them together. So especially as you noted in the start, uh, in the introductions that the topics and rubrics should be understood less as uh, descriptions than as propositions. So, you know, I'm, I'm certain that you had an inkling for how these would shape up, but now that you've had the chance to hear all of the different contributions, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about your thinking uh, about, you know, the relation, the relationality between London and Asia and, um, thinking through the different kind of topics and rubrics and their particular sequencing. And um, maybe like, you know, a different way of, you know, asking this question would be to say like, you know, um, what are some highlights, you know, of what you think the conference has accomplished in think rethinking or decolonizing the relationship? Um, and if you feel, if you're feeling maybe more modest or pensive, what has, you know, putting those two terms together occluded or made more difficult? So maybe I'll just open it up. And as uh, Sarah said there, I think this is very much, you know, meant to be for everyone. So it's not just limited to the three conveners. So if you have thoughts you'd like to contribute, please share them in the chat. I think we're, we're aiming for that. Yeah, we thought the chat actually, we were talking about this when we had a little pre-meet, weren't we? That the chat somehow is a little bit more open and people, everyone can see the chat. Sometimes we know with the Q&A, there's a bit of a time lag and, um, you know, it, it doesn't always come through to um, all the panelists. And uh, so, yeah, you, let's use the chat and we can just get that idea of conversation going. But maybe if I um, can just start with um, thinking about... Um, your question, John, and I think the place that I would want to start is um, the comma between London and Asia in the title, because I think that um, is a, an interesting point on, on, on which to rest and, and, and reflect. And I think it is very different to saying London and Asia, or even London hyphen Asia or London slash Asia. And I think that comma again, is, is, it, it acts as a, again, a, a place, a, a kind of maybe a, a point um, to think um, about relationships together. And um, for me as well, it also offers the moment when you say London, comma, Asia, a moment to pause if, in speech um, or in the process of reading those to two terms together. Um, and I think, again, that sort of um, change of scale, it asks us to reflect on um, what's a, a city doing next to a region. And I think for us, it, again, it, it, it's, it's meant to be provocative in um, resisting easy geopolitical positioning or framing. And I think, it, you know, to use... Um, Yi Wan's phrasing um, from the beginning of this session as well about um, what changes of scale do to the ways in which we think and how they can um, perhaps ask us to think differently about relationality as well beyond rather um, kind of formal or set geo geopolitical framings of um, a nation or a region or um, continents. And so I think um, for me, and again, the, all the papers and presentations and commissions and projects are part of that provocation to not define what those relationships are, but again, to present provocations of what they have been and, and, and what they might be um, and what it, what it does to our our histories to think through um, those things together, those uh, you know, overlapping territories, intertwined histories, to use um, Saeed's phrase. Um, and I think, again, it's for me, trying to think beyond a comparative framework as well of A and B. Um, and again, um, by thinking out of that into a much more messy and complex space, um, what those um, terms do to one another, not what does one do to the other. So that's where to start with that comma. Um, and again, just to try and get us 
you know, and it's really interesting for me, obviously working, as we've said many times in this uh, introductions to this conference in a in an institution that is called the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies um, in, in British art, um, you know, what then, you know, what that does to ideas about um, framing arts histories through nations and the, and the pressures and the challenges um, to, to the work and to the programme um, that we organise here by thinking these things, by thinking arts and its worlds um, together. So I'll, I'll um, hand over to, to Ming, perhaps, um, as she's on the right of me on the screen to maybe continue some of those opening thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you for that wonderful question, John. Um, I think for me, I, I just really like to build on this idea that, you know, we're trying to think beyond comparison or we're thinking critically about comparison beyond perhaps. Um, and for me, two really critical terms that came out of the conference were something very neatly um, bookending the conference um, that came from Lila Gandhi, the idea of chiasmic abstraction um, on the one hand and the possibility of epistemological nonviolence that that brings up, right? The idea that two um, elements can be held together at once in this possibility of abstraction um, that brings together um, various concepts. Um, and also Patrick Flores's idea of Kalibutan, the idea of um, you know, being around and, and um, the way that he evoked um, contrapuntalism as well um, in his description or sort of theorization of Kalibuntan. And I think that one thing that um, has emerged from all of our conversations over the past five weeks, can you imagine, um, has been this um, idea of in-betweenness, using that in-betweenness critically so that we are positioning discourses somewhere between um, a critical engagement with empire, but also with decolonization, right? That, you know, um, Patrick today was talking about the D and the importance of um, thinking through the D um, in a way that is not um, precious, right? That is critical and trying to find those stories that enable an understanding of what is produced out of that encounter and what is produced out of um, the sort of, uh, I guess what you described as um, uh, the, what happens when we think beyond bureaucracy and um, you know, um, the structures of, of empire to understand these um, traces, the, the, the affective, production of sociality, of art, you know, what does art do? That's something that's really important that has come out of the discussions as well, that it provides a space of exploration and expression that goes beyond, I think, um, what, what structures exist. Um, and, you know, of course, it, the other thing that is really important, um, I think, is to interrogate those structures themselves. And um, I think this is something that um, has come out of all of our conversations um, that, you know, in art history, we don't really think enough about questions of bureaucracy, um, of circulation, of encounter, um, of, um, of art schools as well. Um, that, you know, these are just different ways of asking questions um, that we are hoping will get beyond um, it, the structure, the colonial uh, um, epistemologies. Um, so, you know, really just complicating things um, and holding um, different elements together. I think maybe at this point I will pass it along to Hamad. Yes, it's all sounding very neat and, and orderly. So yeah, we'll, we'll mess it up as we go along. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of gonna go back to the comma for an instant, because I, I, I think um, that is key. And beyond uh, the sort of the, the, the readings that Sarah was sharing with you, I also wanna go back to the conventional use of the comma when it comes uh, between a city and a larger place. And it's about a claim. Um, and I think it's about thinking about London as a site 
within Asia. Uh, it's histories, but certainly it's, um, it's, it's art histories. And um, as we look at your wonderful background, John, um, and the uh, sort of the David Madala work that we see behind you, um, I, I think it also sort of reminds us um, as it's been so beautifully accomplished uh, beyond any of our um, imaginings, I think in this final session, is it's tying back to that, that question that Ming was just raising about what art does. Um, and what art does is it functions at these so many different levels, you know, at, at, uh, at the level of the, of the luxury good um, in Art Basel, um, at the level of, the, um, of soft diplomacy um, or soft power at, at, at Venice or of um, philosophical proposition or of a political urgency as some of our uh, other speakers sort of highlighted and its ability to do all of these things at once. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been sort of trying to think through um, and hence, you know, this juxtaposition of multiple commas and the ands as, as you know, the, the various uh, using the structure of our, our different sessions was allow this possibility uh, to occupy that space in between, um, to, to both pause, but also claim on, on both sides. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of um, what we were trying to achieve, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think we'd, any of us would go for that heroic one of that uh, we, do we decolonize art history now. Uh, let's move on. Next discipline, please. Um, it was more of a question of, you know, what are the tools that we're going to develop? And if we think about this conference as perhaps a way of inviting people in to shape some things together, you know, so we have maybe a few, um, a few materials at hand. Um, and, and it was that sort of invitation that the difference between when you, inv when you invite people in, of course, there's always that frisson of that people will accept your invitation. Uh, and then it's this question of, well, what, did they, what will they do with it? Um, and that is in a way what's, uh, what this conference has been about people in accepting that invitation um, and then taking it elsewhere to places where we perhaps may not know where to go. If I can yet. Add, add to that, um, Hamad, as well, and just the, from um, a, a comment that one of the speakers said to me that um, how different it felt to speak on a panel with other people that you have never met before and you don't know because as much as we like to think we operate, you know, interdisciplinary uh, or an inter in an interdisciplinary way, or you know, we work globally, we still there's still structures um, which mean that when we go to conferences, we're often on panels with the same people, or you know, all, our work is organised in particular modes that um, you, you know it, it gets put into certain um, framings. And um, I think that trying to kind of um, create conversations across um, you know, speakers and artworks or practices that might not immediately on paper sit together has been really interesting um, for me as well. Just that ability to think um, or create conversations across time periods as well as places. Yeah, and I think that, you know, one thing that um, I was really struck by, not just the kind of uh, the, the, the way that each of the panels has been a kind of a different proposition for thinking the, the, the relation, right, the, the comma, like understanding what is that comma doing, what is that fulcrum, what is that pause, what is that space, right? Um, but also the way that there's a certain kind of rhythm to them. Uh, so maybe to employ the kind of the, the jazz or musical kind of um, um, language that Patrick was employing, that there's a certain kind of cadence, right? So it starts there. I think it's not accidental that you start with sociality and affect as a kind of a, as the opener, right? And it's certainly, I imagine, no accident that this last session is thinking from Asia, right? And so the, the way that you scored this kind of um, conference, you know, it's, it seems like um, there, there was a kind of an, uh, some thought put into that. And I was wondering if you might share with us 
a little of your thinking about how how they were arranged because it's not just like okay we'll we'll do the like the the hard stuff like bureaucracy and you know like and empire first and then we'll like you know move to the soft stuff it was kind of like there's a certain kind of uh, beat to it well, that's a lovely analogy, um, John. Um, and if I could give maybe an indirect response, because um, and, and, and in a way, um, I, th I think it's going back to that idea of jazz and improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, and I will sort of use an example of an artwork that actually sort of summarizes this uh, or points to it and uses it as a metaphor. Um, and also points to that capacity for music, and maybe we can also bring Patrick in at some point and talk about this, is that one of the great things about music is it has this capacity to smuggle meaning, mm -hmm. um, where other types of meaning, so whether it be books or certainly sort of broadcasts, et cetera, may, may face uh, a certain type of policing. Mm -hmm. um, music somehow manages to sort of seep through. And um, appropriately enough, um, at the uh, at the, the pavilion um, of the United Arab Emirates at the Venice Biennale in 2017, the artist Lantian Shi, as part of his project, uh, invited um, two Filipino musicians based in Hong Kong to come to Ven Venice and play uh, a sort of a series of, of works um, that that riffed from the, the soundtrack of his childhood. Which, which moved from American jazz classics to Egyptian jazz to, to Bollywood. Uh, and that childhood was in, in um, the cosmopolitan of places of, of Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in, in that was, was this, this juxtaposition of three things, you know, Bollywood, uh, Egyptian jazz, uh, American um, sort, of, sort of classics, and the fact that, you know, as again, that evocative photograph that Patrick shared with us of, mm -hmm. of the musicians in India from the Philippines. So that circularity um, and that rhythm that mm -hmm. sort of uh, flows, that kind of the music and improvisation allows. Uh, yeah. And maybe I'll sort of pass on to Ming because in a, in a way what we were also doing is um, we were having jamming sessions. Uh, as we were thinking about, you know, what would be the structure uh, of this uh, conference, Ming? Absolutely. I mean, it, it was a, it was a, a, an incredibly transformative process, actually, and one that was that took a lot of time and care. I've never been involved in organizing a conference um, where we spent as much time sort of crafting the shape of it and then choosing every single speaker very, very carefully. And then also engaging with each person um, before they spoke in advance. Um, and, you know, it was a process that um, took as its starting point, the three um, foci of London Asia, which were exhibitions, art schools and institutions. Um, and whereas the foci of London Asia were almost place-based, right? They were sites, hubs, um, felt a little bit more um, um, contained. What we wanted to do was we wanted to take those sites and we wanted to open them up so that they became operations, so that they became, um, you know, a toolbox for under for asking new questions about the history of art. And so, you know, exhibitions became circulation and encounter, art schools became pedagogy and learning, institutions right. became bureaucracy and agency, right? And yeah. then through all of those, we were also thinking about, of course, you know, the possibilities of friendship, um, which, you know, also grew organically out of this organizational process, but also which we felt provided a, an affective way of accessing these histories um, that otherwise are not being told, right? What happens when all of these people are in London at the same time? What kinds of affective bonds are created that potentially spin out to new histories? And then potential histories and solidarities are very, were, were very much about the politics of those um, encounters and friendships and what that produced. Um, we didn't want to forget about art, um, aesthetics and ways of knowing became the site where we were asking the question, what can art do? 
And then, of course, thinking through empire and thinking from Asia was very um, important for us in terms of really um, addressing the question of colonialism head on um, and providing um, a framework that would enable um, both a questioning of empire, but also um, a speaking back that we did not want to um, render Asia into a geography. We wanted Asia there to be a question mark. We wanted Asia to be a, a concept, a conceptual um, proposition, which, um, you know, I have to say, Patrick, you took that on so beautifully. So um, thank you for that. Um, and I, I hope that gives you some idea of, you know, what the thinking was behind um, the planning. Yeah, that, that's really helpful and kind of um, wonderfully illuminating. Um, I, I want to maybe return to this uh, question of improvisation that Hamad uh, brought up and um, maybe, you know, talk a little about not just like, you know, the, the content of the conference uh, in, our, in our history, but also the, the, the form of the conference, because it's an online, you know, it's an online conference, which now I guess we're all used to, but it's still relatively fresh and new. So, you know, there was some experimentation here. And so it's not just like, you know, panels and speakers, but there was also, you know, um, Parasia's, um, uh, the cabaret last night. Um, and, um, and, I, and also maybe something else, which I'm wondering if you want, you want to talk about or? There were wops from the Gibbot Day, Ulla Mamma Bruins. Buckle the Babbles didn't take up boo or her foot one day, while you know. Bram Rumutram or Mirri, I really say. Braggles up the tea, wops through Hood Howdy. Braggles are really miss a mouth, like a wad drunk sip. Dick, wobble the Babbles to wobble the bar. A quizzing out, Bram, drop. Brand with the Kawagis room room with a how do so many cup. Bam, take up this with a car hill. Oh, I love to say, Papa, the womb deep. Mamma, bray, a cock, he could yap a chappy, sneak it out of the he bra broken with the wa, the ye with the wow. So I think that's that is out of the bag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't have to have Zoom poker faces on anymore um, because I think that's the first time that a credit has appeared at the end of one of the glitches in uh, the Zoom conferencing system. Um, and each of our panels has been Zoom bombed and there's been a lot of conversation that's happened around those glitches um in the chat um afterwards um people emailing in saying what happened there like is this is this for real um and um i think we can reveal now that this has been an intervention as you saw by the artist mitu sen who um was part of the artist commission program that we um uh, organizers to run through throughout the um, London Asia Art Worlds program and um, we had a, a really productive conversation with her before the event started about online conferencing and um, the spaces of hospitality, digital hospitality that such platforms um, create and, and, and Mitu uses um, social media a lot, especially Instagram as a space in which to connect and um, converse with um, audiences and, and, and the public. Um, but we're also talking about what it means to host conversations like this online and the, the, the formulas of, um, of online um, debate and conversation and dialogue and the ways in which Zoom webinars are starting to structure the way we speak and communicate, you know, mic off, mic on, video on, video off. It's, you know, again, it's um, maybe it's a bit hard to jam sometimes. 
<laughs> you know, you sort of <laughs> improvisation can be slightly static as you're fumbling with your microphone and, and trying to come on screen again. So um, yeah, Mitu created a, a series of videos of glitches to really ask us questions about the ways in which we had structured the event um, and, and made um, a glitch that responded to each theme of, of the conference. Yeah, I think it's oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I was just gonna say, I mean, I really, you know, I like, as you know, I, I totally didn't know that this was uh, planned. Um, and I was really kind of um, surprised that shocked, I think was the word I used when I found out. But also, I think it's, you know, it's, it's really kind of um, ingenious to take something which, you know, I think, we think of as kind of um, uh, an obligation, you know, having these online con congregations, but at the same time to think about the format of it and find some way to kind of introduce these moments of um, accident or, you know, um, kind of uh, the unexpected, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I'm sorry for the spoiler, John. <laughs> um, I think it's also useful happen. to, yeah, I, I, I think it's useful to think about the concept of the glitch and what that actually does in the context of not just this, the Zoom, uh, Zoomosphere um, and the conference, but also in the context of um, discourse sort of writ large. I remember when we were having one of our meetings with Me Too um, and she talked about how she felt like the um, scholarship she had gotten to go and study in the UK was actually a glitch in the system, that she was a glitch in the system, right? Mm. Um, and that it really um, enables a kind of critique that um, both takes from and um, engages critically with um, dominant structures. You know, the, the way that Patrick was saying earlier, you know, how do you, um, how do you detach from colonial structures? You can't really but you can glitch them, right? Um, in the sense that, you know, we can glitch the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art and that there can be this productive conversation that takes place mm -hmm. um, through various, um, you know, I mean, I, I think it was very clever for her to use, to use this format um, to, do, to do that. Mm. Where did the idea come from? Oh, yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah, yeah. So she was yeah. like, "I'm going to, I'm going to hijack your your conference at various." Yeah, I was like... <laughs> yeah I'm, and I'm and I'm sure Sarah wouldn't mind me sharing that there was this little little instance of where there was, oh my god, what have we done? We invited somebody. <laughs> what is she going to want to do? Uh, uh, what will happen to the, uh, uh, the you know? the Paul Mellon Center Instagram feed or what will happen to this. So in, in fact, now we, we're, you know, Sarah's got a broad smile on her face and you know, <laughs> we're, all, uh, we're all enjoying this. But there was that frisson because it is about, well, when you make an invitation, particularly to an artist, um, I think that that invitation is also one where you are sort of going out, you know, where, where or it should be or, or it, and if it's not, I think it's completely within the right and of the artist or whoever is being invited to take that agency. So I think that idea of, uh, of host guest invitation versus smuggler, I think they're much more, um, they're much more overlapping uh, or mm -hmm. perhaps one of the things that we're arguing is that they should be. Mm. It's interesting actually as well, like you know what what space are we meeting in because again and it just relates to perhaps something to you know the the conversation that we only really just started about the commons as well and this idea you know that zoom is it provides us with this sort of democratic space where we don't need a visa to gather here do we you know it's um there's been no charge for the conference you just you have to registered and then there's a link but of course there's a, a big subscription to zoom a, a private company to make this happen um so i just think it's quite interesting isn't it um in thinking about how different this conference would have been if um, you know as it, it was originally conceived that we would have done it uh, hosted it at the paul mellon center in london and would mm. have spent you know probably 
I don't know, 75% of the budget on flights. You know, this was all pre-pandemic. And, you know, as I'm saying this out loud, you, it sounds crazy now, actually, <laughs> in, in a way. Um, and, you know, what's, what I've really thought about as well as, as we've had the question and answers and the chat is, you know, when you organise um, an event in person, you spend most of your budget on the speakers. You don't pay for your audience to come and travel to be with you. And that's yeah. been really interesting in this, the kind of gatherings that we've had, you know, on this weekly basis that the audience have come in from very different places, our, you know, our historians, curators, artists, members of the public. Um, yeah. And that's actually just made me think again about the future when you're you know, organizing events. It's not only who you invite to be on the stage with you and who you say, you know, here, here have this commission, have this for us, for the artists, it was a digital space on the, on the Paul Mellon Center's website. But it's interesting to think about, um, yeah, you know, who's who's in the audience as well and how do you enable those conversations that um, between speakers and, and community um, as well. So it has, it's really made me think about the future of programming um, and creating conversations. And, you know, again, these very practical concerns about, you know, how do you shape something? Um, mm -hmm. How do you pay for it? Um, and so I think that's been, um, it sounds maybe, it, again, it's very bureaucratic in some ways, but it, it goes back to these questions about the structures of art worlds, um, what gets exhibited, what gets written about, who gets to speak about it, who gets to interact with it. So for me personally, as you know, someone who runs a research program, it has really, um, I think pushed, yeah, pushed me to think harder about that. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly kind of, um, I think it's something that all of us, you know, who are kind of working with programs are thinking about, I mean, you know, the kind of the shifts and changes, right, and the kind of conversations that, you know, being online has enabled. But um, I think going back to, to the Zoom bombing, we have a comment uh, from Dipti Kara saying, uh, I must write to her and share all of my screen grabs and obsession with the Zoom bomber that I mentioned yesterday in our informal conversation. Or maybe the PMC will invite me to send for a conversation and response in a separate event. Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a really good idea because me too as well. I mean, again, with the other artists, because they're um, the commissions, the Queer Asia's group, um, yeah. Mapping Memory Project, um, and uh, Sophia Balangawala's um, film were released on the same day. You know, mm. they all had the artist bio. In a way, we made an exhibition space for them. Uh, and Mitu was operating in this, um, you know, different space. So um, I think, yeah, we, we Dipti, um, you know, uh, I think you're right. It, it, it's, uh, it merits a, a conversation to discuss these ideas more with, with, with Mitu. Yeah, and speaking about that, and maybe as a way of wrapping up, um, since I think we're we're reaching time, I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little about you know some of the the kind of the the future, and you, we've been talking, we've talked about futurity, or we've heard about futurity, and I was wondering if you could talk a little about futures of London Asia art worlds. Um, Ming, you talked a little about the digital collaboration project right um, at the start. But um, there's, you have a lot of plans for London Asia. It's not, it's not, this is not really the end. This is kind of like a beginning, right? So. It is in many ways. Um, it's very exciting to, to see this gathering momentum. Um, and, you know, one of our plans is to create a publication that will come out or publications perhaps that will come out of um, this gathering um, as well as, um, subsequent workshops that we're hoping to have, um, both with um, the incredible uh, papers that were submitted, but which were not be, we were not able to accommodate into mm -hmm. this um, particular digital format. Um, but also, as you know, John, um, through some workshops that we're hoping to have with Asia Art Archive around questions of art and pedagogy. Um, and then the digital project, um, which I addressed earlier, you know, these are really all ways of thinking collaboratively with others. Um, I will let Sarah and Hamad talk about the exhibition that they have um, planned um, that they're working on together. Would one of you sure. like to take that up? Um, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. But I think before talking about the exhibition, I think also sort of go back to 
um, the last, well, the first publication that, that we did, uh, which was a di digital publication. And at that time we had been sort of thinking about, you know, some of the principles, I wouldn't be so grand as to call it a manifesto, but it felt like that of sorts um, in, in our editorial where we laid out some ground rules uh, for what are we, um, what are our ambitions for not just what uh, London Asia could do, but how it would do it. And one of the things we laid down was that we want to, we want to be able to sort of socialize a field. Um, and although certainly London Asia is not finishing, it's just the last panel of this particular uh, conference as murmuration. Um, it is, as, as you rightly say, John, uh, very much, it's, it's a staging post, it's a milestone. It's, it's, uh, and it's fantastic that we still have more than 30 people uh, after four hours. You guys are, you know, gluttons for punishment. Uh, but, uh, but it's terrific to have this core. And part of this is, well, how, where do we take this together? Ming's talked about the, the sort of the collaborative forms of research, uh, the publication that will be informed and enriched and shaped by some of the things that we've been going through together these last five weeks and we'll continue in the next few months. Um, and the exhibition project that Sarah and I uh, are co-curating with Amy Tobin uh, at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge was also something that was um, cooked together out of uh, a series of other, other things, a, a paper um, that actually was the genesis of, uh, in, you know, where, where Sarah and I sort of formed London Asia, which in part, was a paper I presented arguing that the the exhibition that you're that that you have behind you, John, is uh, sort of the other story is mm -hmm. haunting British art history. Yeah. Uh, and before um, British art hi historians have a chance to exercise that ghost, new stories are being written elsewhere, um, mm -hmm. in from Sharjah to Taipei to Karachi. And one yeah. of those examples that we used was about Li Wanxia. Uh, who is being positioned as the father of uh, abstract and conceptual art in Taiwan, you know, a place he left in 62 and never went back, um, mm -hmm. but was kind of missing from the canons of art history in, in Britain. Um, so it started as, you know, one paper, another paper, um, then a conference that uh, accompanied an exhibition I curated at Manchester Art Gallery with Kate Jessen called Speech Acts. And out of that conference really came this energy again that collectivity um, that sort of Amy also sort of typified because she came to Li Wancha as really as an, as an audience member first, as mm -hmm. to say, and, and that's what's shaped uh, that particular uh, exhibition. And what we are hoping for that to do is also not be just around, you know, to do that trick that, uh, you know, museums often do or art history, history does is to, you know, iron out any of the creases to, you know, become this sort of monographic study about something. We're really interested in thinking through how we can have an exhibition and a publication that will allow the mess um, or what um, Patrick in his usual and poetic way expressed better as a, a sort of curatorial thinking or mm -hmm. that constellation mode thinking of allowing different things and relationships uh, to emerge, which we feel is kind of essential for uh, if we are able to open up the field of art history um, to actually even keep up with the field of art. Mm. Mm. I think here, you know, Patrick's idea of rework um, is also very important that it's a, a way of taking the sedimentations of history and um, allowing them to re-sediment so that we are looking at old geological layers anew and sort of understanding what those connections can be when we, under, when we see them from the perspective of today, yes, but also activate those histories, you know, to use, and to use Azule's term, um, what potential histories are we able to um, activate? through this kind of work. Mm -hmm. It is interesting as you know, as you're um, all speaking, it, it does make me think about um, the pressures that this kind of research and collaboration puts on existing modes 
of publication, of exhibition making, um, these practices which are, you know, multivocal, contain, you know, again today we've spoken about posters and uh, jazz and exhibitions and magazines, you know, multi multi-formed um, research, how you bring that together and uh, publish it um, and make conferences about it and um, think about exhibitions that reach across um, time periods and, and, and geographies. I think again is it, just one of these really productive challenges and yeah, I think the digital does help us in, in, in um, think through formats and modes but of course it's not a kind of um, answer to all prayers, it comes with its own uh, restrictions. So I, I'm, I'm kind of um, you know daunted and excited by mm. the, the challenges of um, research in, in, this, in, this, um, in this kind of way. Mm. Well, you know, that brings to mind um, a, a term that we've been throwing around almost um, as a kind of um, a joke amongst ourselves, um, practices of abundance. The idea that, you know, um, these, this work has so many different um, facets to it. It's interdisciplinary, it's in, um, it works between media, um, and, you know, the, the, the point of this really is it gets back to what um, you know Patrick and Yuan and, and Tim Barringer were talking about just that um, we're finding ways of trying to exceed these colonial epistemologies and that in doing so there is going to be a lot of mess and there are going to be these um, geological layers and sort of ice as archive um, that that bear testament to the um, intertwined layers and the ways in which we're in, unable to separate them. Yeah, I mean, I'm just that, that idea of excess. I mean, um, a couple of years ago, I think in a, in a conversation um, for Art Journal with uh, Karen Zitzewitz to try to sort of spell out this idea of art histories of excess. Um, and I, and, you know, and behind that was this notion that, you know, art histories which kind of exceed every type of, of container um, of the object, uh, of the institution, uh, of the nation, uh, and of the mode of inquiry. So, you know, for, for, for something that could allow um, a study that can follow art uh, in it, as it goes, uh, as it uh, goes in its, you know, various ways, as luxury good, as, you know, uh, proper philosophy, as politics, etc. And the only way we can do that is through a collaborative effort. Uh, so part mm -hmm. and, and on collaboration, as we know, is really hard work and it takes time and it takes- uh... Are you gonna say, Hamad? <laughs> <laughs> Should we take this personally? <laughs> this is where we all <laughs> <John Hamad. laughs> This is where the truth <laughs> comes out. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, this yes. kind of work is not possible without collaboration, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, before you two started putting words in my mouth, what I was, was what, I, what I was trying to get to was that we have to, uh, with, with collaborate, you have to sort of spend the time because you have to sort of push, because um, it's an idea that it's not just up to you. It's also about you put something out there uh, mm -hmm. and be prepared for it to be, you know, chipped away or taken elsewhere or or shaped in a different way. Uh, and then follow it and, and perhaps, you know, be, be flexible enough to allow that idea to run. Mm. 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 Yeah, and I think that's where Me Too really pushed us um, in productive ways. I really felt the vulnerability of that in a, a, a good way, right? Mm. That um, we were putting our invitation out there and, you know, her, her first response was she was going to hijack something and we didn't know what. And you know, it was really very much about trust, right? Right, um, and and enabling um, the co-constitution of a public sphere through that kind of trust, empathy, and you know, um, emplacement, I guess, in her hands. And I think here we just also need to acknowledge um, the work of Shauna Blanchfield, who's the yes. manager who many of people who have interacted with, because to make those glitches happen, 
and to get the timing right. So, um, you know, presenters were not completely thrown off um, giving their paper. Um, Shauna executed, um, you know, those uh, those glitches uh, perfectly. So that was a collaboration uh, with Me Too that again, all these things that happen behind the scenes, um, but uh, Shauna was definitely a key collaborator in, in making that happen. So um, thanks so much uh, Shauna and uh, also Danny um, as well, Danny Conway. Arvin. And Danny for her wonderful comments, like don't, don't worry, this won't affect your computer. <laughs> <laughs> So they are part of uh, Mitu's team now. I'm sure she'll be <laughs> employing them in, uh, you know, for any other future um, glitch productions. They've been appropriated and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of fun with it. Mm. So at this point, uh, let's see, we had a question, but I think it's been answered. Uh, someone was asking, Asima Mera was asking if they'll have access to the webinar. I think Shauna has very capably answered that. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, in some ways it's kind of a, a nice sentiment. So maybe I'll just read part of it, which is, uh, I am an artist who works in and between South Asia and North America, uh, which in itself struggles with being policed as Hamad mentioned. Um, would love to share the conversation with artists here who are also working to squeeze themselves out and through the constructed doors of a monolithic Western globalization of the next moment. Uh, London is on my route from Mumbai to Vancouver, Vancouver that encompasses the world within it and is experiencing the struggle of the native peoples and others who were shipped from post-colonized spaces in an effort to be able to be visible as Ming says, resediment. So. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to see that question. Asima uh, Meha, interesting. Yeah. I'm also yeah. from Vancouver. Mm. <laughs> but it's true that there are so many further conversations to be had. Um, I think also about understanding what all of these politics of entanglement mean when one moves outside of London to other um, parts of the former British Empire, right? That, you know, what, what, what does London Asia look like in Vancouver? I think that's an important question, actually. And yeah. it's a question that has um, interesting resonances in terms of understanding how, um, you know, Black British art was understood in Vancouver, um, how um, artists in um, a Canadian sphere who are thinking about multiculturalism might address um, themselves to London, they might address themselves to the United States, and sometimes, and and also to our our own site in you know on on native lands, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a settler of color in those contexts, and how do those politics um, change when you move from one place to another? So many things to talk about in the future. Yeah. I think for sure there's definitely, I think, you know, and I, I think, you know, for me, it's been extremely uh, interesting to think about this last session, thinking from Asia. And, you know, I think, you know, Patrick's talk was certainly very rich and um, dense in terms of possibilities. But I think that there's just, you know, so much to consider and take into account, you know, and thinking about the, the, the two sides or the kind of the two terms and the comma that, you know, um, joins them, but also separates them, the pause that is also the connector. Um, and, you know, how to how to kind of maybe think about that, you know, further, you know, uh, from Asia, so. Yeah, and actually, um, Patrick's point about the world being the only plural in the title, <laughs> and then it yeah. made me think about, obviously, London's. <laughs> and ages and arts and worlds um, as well. So I, th I thought that was, um, again, the to think a little bit more about plural pluralities and um, yeah, how, how that operates or they operate within um, the terms that we've, we've um, mobilized in the title. That just really, um, yeah, lodged in my, in my mind as I was thinking through, um, yeah, our, 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 um, our title for this event. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I, I think that it enables us to um, think more critically about our terms um, than, we, than we did when we were beginning. And, and I think that's a good place to be. Yeah. 
Okay, so maybe that's a good, also a good, good note <laughs> to kind of uh, wrap up uh, today. And uh, I don't know, should I hand things over to you, Sarah, to do yeah. the honors or? Okay. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, John, for, for joining us for, in that conversation. And um, again, the, the collaboration with Asia Art Archive across many years, um, actually when Hamad was uh, working there and, and through to um, you know, currently with the, the the conversations that uh, we've had with you and your team are again just incredibly productive for us as we uh, continue to think through and around um, these ideas together. So uh, thank you so much for helping us shape this uh, wrap up uh, conversation um, as well. No easy task when we feel like we're unfolding rather than um, wrapping up. But um, yes, thank you to our stalwart um, audience for being with us uh, to the end and to all the speakers, not only um, of this um, wonderful final panel, but um, again, across the eight uh, panels that we've had um, and like I said, to our audience, um, okay. that has just been amazing. Um, and the artists and all the support team that have made everything happen. And we hope that you'll share the recordings widely, you'll watch them again, um, and we will be just digesting um, all the energy um, and the provocations of the ideas that have been presented um, across the five weeks of the conference. So um, I think I'll just say uh, thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Hamad and Ming again. And um, yeah, I look forward to when we next get to meet under um, a, a London, London's Asia's art world, arts and world's uh, umbrella. That will be um, uh, uh, something to look forward to indeed. Yeah, looking forward to the next iterations. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.